Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. My guest today, Holden Karnowski, is one of the most significant figures in the development of effective altruism. He's been applying his substantial intellectual energy to finding great giving opportunities since 2007, when he founded GiveWell along with Eli Hassenfeld. This has given him more hands-on experience with how to actually assess very varied giving opportunities, get around the huge uncertainties involved, and build a thriving research team than anyone else I know. As a result, he's ended up as the primary advisor to Good Ventures, a cost-effectiveness-focused foundation which expects to give away billions of dollars over its lifetime. I should say that Good Ventures is 80,000 Hours' largest funder, though I don't think that's changed anything about this interview. We've recorded this episode now because the Open Philanthropy Project is hiring for a large number of roles, which we think would allow the right person to have a very large positive influence on the world. They're looking for a number of entry-level researchers to train up, three specialist researchers into potential risks from artificial intelligence, as well as a director of operations, operations associate, and general counsel. I'll put up a link to the jobs page in the show notes. If you'd like to get into global priorities research or foundation grant making, this is your moment to shine and actually put in an application. This interview is likely to be of pretty broad interest to most regular subscribers, though if you have no interest in working at OpenPhil, you can probably skip our discussion of their office culture and the jobs they have available towards the end of the show. That said, don't miss our discussion at the very end of the show about Holden's public opinion survey of various different utopias. Without further ado, I bring you Holden Karnowski. Today, I'm speaking with Holden Karnowski. Holden was a co-founder of the charity Evaluated GiveWell and is now the executive director of the Open Philanthropy Project. He graduated from Harvard in 2003 with a degree in social studies and spent the next several years in the hedge fund industry before founding GiveWell in 2007. Over the last four years, he has gradually moved to working full-time at the Open Philanthropy Project, which is a collaboration with the Foundation Good Ventures to find the highest impact grant opportunities. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Holden. Thanks for having me. So we plan to talk about some kind of thorny methodological questions that um, the Open Philanthropy Project faces, uh, the kinds of people you're looking to hire at the moment, uh, because you do have a few vacancies, and how listeners can potentially prepare themselves to, to get a job working with you. But first off, while I think a lot of the audience will have some familiarity with GiveWell and the Open Philanthropy Project, maybe start by telling the story of uh, what these organizations do and how they developed. Sure. So um, I'm currently the executive director of the Open Philanthropy Project, and I am co-founder, though I no longer work at GiveWell. And they're very related organizations, so maybe the easiest way for me to talk about what they do is to just kind of go through the story of how GiveWell started and how that led to Open Philanthropy. So GiveWell started in 2007 when Ellie Hassenfeld and I uh, worked at a hedge fund, and we wanted to give to charity, and we wanted to sort of get the best deal we could. We wanted to help the most people with the least money. And we found that we had a lot of trouble figuring out how to do this. We sort of, you know, we, we tried using existing charity rating systems. We tried talking to foundations who largely, you know, didn't tell us much. We tried talking to charities um, who a lot of the time were, were kind of hostile and, and didn't, you know, appreciate the inquiries. And at a certain point, we kind of, you know, came to the conclusion that we felt there was, there was not really a, a knowledge source out there that could help people like us figure out, you know, between all the different things charities do, between, let's say, if, if you're trying to help people in Africa, to providing clean water versus providing sanitation services versus providing bed nets to protect from malaria, which one, you know, could help the most people for the least money. And we were having trouble finding that, and we found ourselves very interested in it and sort of more interested in it than our day jobs. So we left the hedge fund, we raised uh, startup funds from our former coworkers, and we started GiveWell. And today, GiveWell publishes research online that's very detailed, uh, very thorough, and sort of looks for charities that you can have confidence in. They're, uh, they're cost-effective. They help a lot of people for a little money. They're very evidence-based. The evidence has been reviewed incredibly thoroughly. Um, and GiveWell also makes sure that there's room for more funding. So each additional dollar you give will help more people. GiveWell currently you know, tracks the money that it moves to top charities and it's, uh, you know, around $100 million a year is going to the charities that it recommends on the basis of its recommendation. A, a few years after starting GiveWell, we met Carrie Tuna and Dustin Moskovitz, and they were facing kind of a similar challenge to what Ellie and I had originally faced, but very different, in that they were looking to give away their money as well as possible, but instead of giving away a few thousand dollars a year, like Ellie and me, they were looking to give away billions of dollars a year over the course of their lifetimes. And so... You know, in some ways, there was a lot of similarity between the challenge they were facing and the challenge we did. 
They wanted to give away money. They wanted to help the most people possible for the least money. And they were having a lot of trouble finding any guidance on how to do this, any research, any intellectual debate of any kind. Difference is that I think the the task they were set up to do is, is fundamentally different from the task GiveWell is set up to do. And so we launched something that at the time was called GiveWell Labs and has since kind of morphed into the Open Philanthropy Project that is, you know, about trying to help people like that do the most good with the money that they're giving away. There are some, you know, really important differences. In some ways, the two organizations have opposite philosophies. So GiveWell tends to look for things that are really proven, where the whole case can be really spelled out online. Open Philanthropy tends to look for things that are incredibly risky, often bold, uh, often work on very long time horizons, and often things that we feel that no other funder is in a position to do, and that it would take, you know, a great deal of discussion and expertise and trust to understand the case for. And so they have kind of fundamentally different philosophies and fundamentally different audiences. GiveWell, uh, you know, now now is, uh, I think, functioning better than it ever has without me, and I am the executive director of Open Philanthropy, so what I currently do is I spend my time trying to build an organization and an operation that is going to be able to give away billions of dollars um, as well as possible. And our current giving is in, you know, between 100 and 200 million dollars a year. So we're kind of at a, you know, at an early-ish phase in our, in our uh, process. So if some listeners have only just heard about this idea of effective philanthropy, uh, why should they care? Do you think it's a particularly important issue that, that people should be focused on? Yeah, I think it's very important. I mean, I think some of the interesting thing about giving, whether it's you know, individuals giving to charity or large scale donors giving to philanthropy, which is my current focus. You know, I think one is that it's it's just clearly an area where you can make a difference, where you can actually change the world. And I think, you know, when we look for the best things, the things that help people the most for the least money, I've been quite surprised personally by just how good they are and how, how much good you can do with how little money. For example, you know, GiveWell estimates that you can sort of avert an untimely death of an infant for every few thousand dollars spent. And open philanthropy kind of aspires while taking more risk and working on longer time horizons to do even better than that. So I think there are great opportunities to do good. And I also think it's a very neglected topic. So I think, you know, the funny thing is that there's a lot of debate in our society about how the government should run, what the government should do. There's even debate about what corporations should do, but there's very little debate about how to do good charity, what foundations should do, what philanthropists should do. Um, it's not considered an intellectual topic generally. And, you know, when people think about philanthropy, they kind of think of just a lot of warm, fuzzy feelings, not a lot of scrutiny. Um, they think about people putting their name on buildings, funding hospitals. And I think that's really too bad because actually I think when you look at the track record of philanthropy, it's had some really enormous impacts. I think it's changed the world for the better and for the worse um, and, and sort of been behind some of the, the biggest stories of the last century. For example, both the uh, the pill, the common oral contraceptive, and the Green Revolution, which is the you know the set of developments that arguably led to several countries, several major countries developing and a billion people uh, avoiding starvation. Both of those had a really significant role for philanthropy. Arguably, were, were kind of primarily backed by philanthropy. So philanthropy really can change the world, and in many ways, I think it uh, presents a given person with a greater opportunity to change the world than you know, then some of the topics to get more attention. And so I think the fact that it is so neglected and that it's generally not considered an intellectual topic creates a huge opportunity to do what other people won't and, and to have an outsized impact on the world. So initially, GiveWell uh, looked at a couple of different problems that people could donate to solve, uh, you know, including poverty in the United States, uh, poverty overseas, and I guess uh, education in the US and, and maybe some others. But it ended up basically focusing on helping uh, po- poverty in the developing world, I guess, especially, you know, extreme poverty and, and, and major health problems. Is that right? Yep, that's right. And so, so what kind of problems does Open Phil now focus on? So Open Philanthropy uh, has looked for causes that are what we call important, neglected, and tractable. And so we have kind of a, a broad set of causes, and especially because when we were getting started, we wanted to try a few different things um, and get a feel for a few different kinds of philanthropy. Uh, one thing that we don't currently work on is global health and development, and the reason for that is that we think GiveWell's top charities are very strong options. If you're, if you're looking to directly help the global poor, you know, we, we aren't sure. Maybe if we put in a lot of work and a lot of research, we would find things that are higher risk and better, but it's not at all obvious that we would. And... Um, you know, we, we feel that GiveWell presents an outstanding option and something that's very hard to beat in that domain. And so what Open Philanthropy has tried to do is look for other ways, other schools of thought on how you might have a lot of impact. And the basic story here is, you know, if you start from the place of, I want to help an inordinate number of people or do an inordinate amount of good with my money, what are some ways that that might happen? And the, the sort of GiveWell approach or the GiveWell philosophy largely comes down to the idea that by sending your money to the poorest parts of the world, to the people who need it most, 
you can have more impact than by sending it, let's say, to your local community. Open Philanthropy works with some different theories. So we work on U.S. policy with the theory being that, you know, as, as Americans, as people embedded in the U.S., uh, we do have some understanding and some networks of the U.S. policy landscape. And there is, you know, a decent historical track record where sometimes, you know, relatively small expenditures by a philanthropist can have a big impact on how governments make decisions, can help governments do better work. And so you can get a big, in some sense, leverage there. You can get a big multiplier. Another thing that we're very interested in is scientific research. So that's another case where, you know, by spending a, a relatively small amount, you can develop a new, be part of developing a new innovation that then becomes shared for free infinitely and globally, and you can have an outsized impact that way. And then a final category for us is global catastrophic risks, where, you know, we feel that the the more interconnected the world becomes, the more it becomes the case that sort of a worst case scenario could have a really outsized global impact. And there's no particular actor that really has the incentive to care about that. Governments do not have the incentive, corporations do not have the incentive to worry about really low likelihood, super duper worst case outcomes. And so, you know, those are those are some of the areas we work in. And, you know, specifically, uh, the causes that we work in uh, have come from a mix we spent a lot of time, we spent really a couple of years just trying to pick causes and doing research on what's important, neglected, and tractable. And we've picked our causes through a mix of what our research found and also, frankly, through our hiring. One of our philosophies is that a lot of how much good you do has to do with who you hire, whether you have the right person for the job. A lot of our philosophy is about finding great people and empowering them to be creative and make individual decisions and have autonomy. And so a lot of the causes we work in have been shaped by whether we've been able to find the right person to work in them. And so, you know, through that, we've, we've come to a relatively small set of major focus areas and then another set of causes that I won't go into here. But um, the, the major focus areas we have at this moment We have a big uh, investment in criminal justice reform. We feel that the U.S. over-incarcerates people really badly. We feel that uh, thorough research has has, uh, made us conclude that this is not helping basically anyone. Uh, This does not provide a public safety benefit, that we could reduce incarceration, reduce the horrible costs of prison, uh, both human and financial, and, and really maintain or improve public safety. And we work in that cause partly, too, because we think there's an opportunity to win. We think it's politically tractable. So, you know, out of all the causes of comparable importance, many of them, you're never going to get anything done unless you can get something done at the national level. But criminal justice reform is a state and local issue. And we think it also is is sometimes less of a partisan issue. You know, a lot of times uh, people on the left and the right are both interested in reducing prison populations because that is cutting government, that is saving money, and that is often helping the least privileged people. So that's a major cause that we work in. Another major cause we work in is farm animal welfare. We uh, believe that one of the ongoing horrors of modern civilization is the way that animals are treated on factory farms. Uh, Just incredible numbers of animals treated incredibly poorly on factory farms. And uh, we believe that we've seen opportunities that are relatively cost-effective where our, our funding has helped contribute to a movement of getting animal welfare to be a higher priority for fast food companies, for grocers, um, and we believe that you know this has led to uh, incredible amounts of just reduction in animal suffering, improvement in farm animal welfare uh, for you know relatively small amounts of money and good cost effectiveness. So that's a major area. And then two other major areas are global catastrophic risks. So we work on biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. If you were to tell me that, you know, somehow the human race was going to be wiped out in the next 50 years and ask me to guess how, one of my top guesses would be a major pandemic, especially if synthetic biology develops and and the kinds of pandemics that are possible become even worse and the kind of accidents that can happen become even worse. So we have a program that's really focused on trying to identify the worst case pandemic risks and prepare the global system for them so they become less threatening. And then another global catastrophic risk we're interested in is potential risk for advanced artificial intelligence, uh, which I think is something you've uh, probably covered before on your podcast and you've happy had a to get into more detail on that. it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, and, and happy to get more into that in a bit. Uh, finally, we do a fair amount of work to support the effective altruism community itself, uh, including 80,000 hours. And then we have, we have a whole bunch of other work. I mean, we do climate change and, and we work on some other U.S. policy issues. Finally, another major area for us is scientific research funding. Um, and so that's where we, you know, we kind of look for moonshot science that we can support. Uh, for example, you know, uh, trying to speed up uh, the use of gene drives technology to eradicate malaria. 
So on the global catastrophic risks and uh, science research um, sides of things, we've had an episode with Nick Beckstead, who uh, works at the Open Planet 3 Project, uh, where we talk quite a lot about those two. And on the factory farming, uh, we have uh, a very popular episode with uh, Lewis Bollard, that, where we spend about three hours talking about all of the different angles on that. So if you're interested in hearing about those uh, two causes in particular, then, then we have other, other episodes for you, to, for you to check out that I'll stick up links to. And I'll also mention that uh, one of the last things we're going to talk about is a whole lot of vacancies that are coming up uh, at Open Phil. So uh, this interview could be quite long, but if you're interested in, in uh, working with Holden, then uh, stick around or maybe just skip to the end to, to, to hear that section about what kinds of people they're looking for and, and how you can apply to work uh, at, at Open Phil. Let's just dig in deeper and find out a bit more about, uh, about how Open Phil actually works. Uh, how much are you hoping to dispense in grants over the, over the next 10 years? Well, over the next 10 years, I mean, we're not sure yet. I mean, what we what we know is that Carrie and Dustin are looking to give away the vast majority of their wealth within their lifetimes. We also believe that uh, we want, you know, philanthropy to become a more intellectual topic than it is. And we have kind of aspirations that, you know, if we do a good job, if we have useful insights on how to do great philanthropy and help a lot of people, that we will influence other major philanthropists as well. And we're already starting to see s- small amounts of that. So over the long run, I know I'm looking there. Over the next 10 years... You know, I, I think it's really TBD, and I think we want to uh, we want to just take things as they come. So I think we're we're you know at, at this stage we're giving away between 100 and 200 million dollars a year, and our priority right now is really to learn from what we're doing, to assess our own impact over time, to build better intellectual frameworks for cause prioritization and deciding how much money goes into which cause and which budget. Um, and so I think I think we have a lot of work to do just improving the giving we're already doing, and I think it'll be better to wait until we have a really strong sense of what we're doing and what we're about um, before we ramp up more, much more from here. So I think the, the last, the next 10 years specifically, I think that just will depend on, on how we're evolving and what opportunities we see. So how do you make specific grant decisions? What's, what's the process by which you end up dispensing money? Sure. So the, the basic process, you know, I mean, the, the basic story or the, or the kind of pieces of philanthropy as I see them, the job of a philanthropist is first to pick causes, pick focus areas, um, pick which issues you're going to work on. So that would be like, you know, for example, saying we're going to work on criminal justice reform, we're going to work on farm animal welfare. And that's something that, as, as I mentioned, and I think somewhat different from, from many other foundations, that was something that we, we put a couple of years into by itself. The next thing that a philanthropist needs to do is, you know, is basically build the right team. And so those are, those are two things that I think are very core to open philanthropy, two things that make us what we are. And to the extent we're doing a good job or a bad job, it comes down to which causes we picked and which people we've hired. Um, when it comes to the grant-making process, what happens is, you know, we generally have a program officer who is the point person for their cause. So uh, for criminal justice reform, it's Chloe Coburn. For farm animal welfare, it's Lewis Bollard. And that person really leads the way. Uh, one of the things we've tried to do at Open Philanthropy is – maximize the extent to which this can be a very autonomy friendly creativity friendly environment uh we don't slap any rubric or you know or requirements on what kind of grants we're going to do and we try to minimize the number of veto points the number of decision makers so it's it's kind of one person out there talking to you know everyone doing everything they can to educate themselves and bringing the ideas to us and then once a program officer wants to make a grant we have a process which we uh which you can link to we've written about it um, but basically they complete an internal write-up, which, you know, asks them to answer a bunch of questions. Like, what is special about this grant? How will we know how it's going? When will we know how it's going? Or what predictions? So we, we ask people to make sort of quantified probabilistic predictions about grants. What are the reservations? What's the best case against this grant? And that person, you know, writes up their case, and then it gets reviewed by me and by Carrie Tuna, who's the president of Open Philanthropy. And that leads to the, you know, that leads to the approval. And then we get to the part of the grant process where, you know, where we need to basically get, you know, get the payment made and get all the terms hammered out. So that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the general outline. Let's look at this uh, another way. Let's imagine that I was a billionaire and I was looking to give away uh, quite a lot of my wealth, uh, but I didn't really know where to start. What would you suggest that, that, that I do? Sure. So, um, you know, I would say, I would say that when you're starting a philanthropy, the, the kind of first order questions are what, areas you're going to work on, what causes, and then also whom you're going to hire, what kind of staff you're going to build, because you're not going to be able to make all the decisions yourself when you're giving away that kind of money. And so, you know, I feel like really the, the most important decision you're going to make is, is who is, you know, who is making the decisions and who is making the grant proposals and how are they doing that. And so what I would urge someone to do if they were a billionaire and they were just getting started, if I had one piece of advice would be to work really hard at those two decisions and, and take them slowly. I think that, um, a lot of times when you go around asking for advice in philanthropy, and I think this kind of reflects that philanthropy is not considered such an intellectual thing, 
a lot of experienced foundations will tell you, you know, you should really just start with the causes that you're personally passionate about. You should take the things you're personally interested in. So if, you know, if homelessness in your hometown, for whatever reason, if that's what strikes you, then that's your cause and that's what you're going to work on. And then from there, you should maybe hire people that you already know and already trust and, and, and then start figuring out what your processes are going to be. And Open Philanthropy does, you know, it's not how every foundation thinks about it, but it's common advice. And Open Philanthropy does act, actually sort of take the opposite view there. We think that, you know, picking a cause, if you're, if you're going to work on homelessness in your hometown versus maybe criminal justice on a national level versus maybe potential risk for advanced AI, that sort of makes maybe maybe like a huge amount of the difference, maybe, maybe almost approximately all of the difference in how much good you're ultimately going to accomplish. And furthermore, some causes are kind of naturally popular because they're you know, they're just naturally appealing. Uh, cities that have a lot of wealthy people are going to be cities that have a lot of philanthropy going into them. Causes that are kind of easy to understand and, and immediately emotionally resonant are going to have a lot of money going into them. Um, and so oftentimes it's the causes that take more work, more thought, more analysis to see the value of that may actually be your best chance to do a huge amount of good. As a, as a billionaire starting off, I would say your first job is to pick causes and probably then to pick people. And, and my biggest advice is to do it carefully and to take your time I think I understand the advice to pick causes quickly because it can be very daunting and very frustrating to not have causes. And it's much easier to get stuff done and to have a clear framework when you do have causes. And certainly we spent a couple of years trying to pick causes. And during that time, you know, it was very it, it, it was just a strange situation. It kind of felt like we weren't doing that much. But in retrospect, I'm glad we put in all that time and, you know, maybe even wish we'd put in more. So how did you go about picking those causes? Sure. So um, when we were originally picking our causes, we basically had these three criteria, uh, importance, neglectedness, and tractability. Importance means we want to work on a cause where a kind of win that we could imagine or an impact we could imagine would be really huge and would benefit a lot of persons and would benefit them a lot. Then there's neglectedness. So on the flip side of this, you know, a lot of the most important causes already have a lot of money in them. A lot of what we did is we tried to figure out, you know, where would we fit in and what would we be able to do differently? And then there's tractability. So all else equal, we'd rather work in a cause where it looks more realistic to get a win on a realistic time frame. And the way that we literally did this is we did these sort of shallow investigations, then medium investigations. So we had a large list of causes. Um, to give an example, we kind of wrote down all of the global catastrophic risks that we had heard about or thought about, things that could really derail civilization, everything from asteroids to climate change to pandemics to geomagnetic storms. And then for each one, we kind of had a couple conversations with experts, we read a couple papers, and we got an initial sense, you know, how likely is this to cause a global catastrophe? What are some of the arguments? Who else works on it? Where is the space for us? And what can we do to reduce the risk? And then, you know, we had this kind of not super quantitative, but but definitely systematic. And we've got the spreadsheets on our website where we rate things by importance, neglectedness, and tractability and took the things that stood out on those criteria. And then we started looking for people to hire in them. And, and then the hiring process somewhat further determined what causes we really got into. So uh, I know that when you chose the particular problems that you did, uh, you kind of committed to, to stick with those for, for quite a number of years because uh, you thought you had to spend some time to really develop That's expertise right. to even know what to do. Do you think that you got the right answers in, in, in the first place? Are there any things that you would do differently if you're doing it again today? I think we have learned a lot since then, and I think we've had a lot of updates since then. So, you know, for, for example, I've written publicly about a series of, you know, major opinion changes that I had that all kind of coincided. This blog post called Three Key Things I've Changed My Mind About, where, you know, I, I currently have a higher estimate of the importance of potential risk for advanced AI specifically than I used to. And that also kind of made me update in the direction of, a lot of the causes that, that some of the most dedicated, effective altruists have, have kind of done a lot of their own research and recommend, um, I think I've moved in the direction of a lot of those causes. So, um, you know, I, I certainly think we've updated our thinking, and um, I'm glad we got moving at, in a reasonable period of time. I'm glad we got some experience. I'm glad we got to try different things. And I think the causes we're in now are really excellent. The ones that we've scaled up, it kind of, we scaled them up over a period of years. And so we were able to see them as we were doing it. And so I think they're excellent causes, but I don't think that that intellectual journey is over. And I think in some ways we're at the beginning of it. So, you know, sure, we picked some initial causes and we made some initial grants and we learned some things about how to give, but our next big mission is uh, trying to figure out, you know, which causes, which focus areas are gonna grow the most. And, you know, as we ramp up giving, what the relative sizes of the budget should be, what the priorities should be, how much money goes into each thing. And I think you could you could see our effective priorities. They may shift over time as we continue to tackle that question, which I think is, you know, a very thorny, somewhat daunting question. I could I could even imagine it taking decades to really work out. But of course we're gonna try and make, you know, pragmatic amounts of progress to make pragmatic amounts of increases in our giving. 
do you, do you expect to still be here in a, in a few decades? Uh, I mean, I don't mean you, but will, will like Open Fill and Good Ventures still exist in a few decades, or is the plan to gradually wind them down? So Carrie and Dustin want to give away the vast majority of their wealth within their lifetimes. That's what they're looking for. I can imagine there being a case to do it faster than that. You know, it depends on how things play out and how we think today's opportunities compare to tomorrow. I think it's very unlikely that it'll be slower. In other words, I don't think they have interest in leaving behind an endowment. Open philanthropy is different. I see open philanthropy as a sort of an intellectual uh, hub for effective philanthropy as, you know, almost almost could serve some of the role of a think tank, although it also operates as a funder. And so I think that, you know, if at some future date, Carrie and Dustin have spent down all their capital, I'm guessing and I'm, you know, sort of hoping, I guess, that if it's doing a good job, that open philanthropy is still around helping other philanthropists make the most of their money. So I, I see open philanthropy as, as more of a, you know, an intellectual institution that has no particular reason to go away at any particular time, as long as it's doing good work. Obviously, it shouldn't continue to exist if it's not. Uh, whereas Carrie and Dustin, you know, they have a fortune and, and they're looking to give it away, um, you know, in a certain period. Could you see open philanthropy, you know, expanding the number of cause areas that it works in, uh, you know, two or threefold uh, over coming decades? Or is it likely to be that you have to add one, you have to take one out? Oh, I think I think there's a really good chance that we're going to increase the number of focus areas we work in. Um, you know, just as we increase our giving, we could do it by increasing the budgets of current areas or going into new ones. And I imagine it'll be a combination. Uh, so what are kind of the, the key themes that tie together all of the focus areas that you've chosen and the focus areas that, that you almost chose? Like why, why is it that these uh, causes stand out in particular? Sure. So, I mean, we went out there to choose causes based on importance, neglectedness, and tractability. And so that's the, you know, the kind of direct answer. And we didn't really optimize for anything other than that. But I would say that, you know, having chosen a bunch of these causes, I think I have noticed a couple of broad buckets that most of them seem to fall into. And there, there are kind of two two theories of how, you know, how a philanthropist might really be onto something big today that isn't getting enough attention that can have a really outsized impact. So one, one theme, and we have a blog post about this idea, is this, this idea of what we call radical empathy, which is this idea that, you know, a lot of the worst kind of behavior in the past, when you look backward and you feel really bad about certain things like, you know, just attitudes toward women and minorities and slavery and things like that, a lot of it can be characterized as just having too small a circle of concern and just saying, you know, we're, we're going to be nice to people who are sort of in our tribe, in our club, in our circle, but then there's this whole other set of, like, people who we're not counting as people, and we don't think they have rights, and we think they're just different, and we don't care about them, and, and we treat them as, like, objects or means to an end. And I think if you, you know, if you could go back in time and do the best philanthropy, a lot of it would be trying to always be working with a broader circle, always be trying to help the people who weren't considered people, but would later be considered people. So, for example, you know, working on abolitionism or, or you know, early feminism or things like that. And a lot of our philanthropy does seem to fall into this category of we're trying to help some population that many of the wealthy people today who have the power to be helpful just don't care about or don't consider people in some sense or, or just aren't really weighing very heavily or highly marginalized. And so, you know, criminal justice reform is certainly an example of this. I mean, you know, people affected by our over-incarceration, you know, disproportionately are, you know, are sort of low income or disproportionate minority. And, and in general, I think also people think about offenders um, or people think about incarcerated persons and think, you know, I don't care about them. I don't care about their rights. Why should I care about their suffering? And so, you know, that is kind of a, a cause where we're, we're trying to help a population that I think is, is quite marginalized and that makes the dollar go further. You could say the same thing about global poverty. You know, the Give Well Top Charities is, is kind of a similar situation where a lot of people believe charity begins at home. Of course, some countries are much richer than others. So the home of the rich people gets a lot of money, gets a lot of charity, and, and, and the, the home of the not-so-rich people doesn't. And so, you know, you just have a lot of people in America who believe that Americans always come first and they don't care about people in Africa. And so you, you get this kind of you know, this opportunity to do extra good by helping an extra marginalized population. And then some of the other work we do is going, you know, a little bit further in that direction to the point where it, it gets like legitimately debatable, in my opinion. Um, so the farm animal welfare work is, you know, I think a lot of people, I mean, I think the reason we're seeing such amazing opportunities in farm animal welfare and such, you know, such sort of high leverage places to get these really quick wins that affect a lot of animals is because most people just don't care about farm animals. They say, you know, chicken, well, that's dinner. That's not, you know, that's not someone I care about. That's not someone with rights. And so, you know, we, we believe that it's possible we'll all look back in 100 years and say that was one of the best things you could be doing is helping these creatures that we now realize we should care about, but at the time we didn't. So that, you know, that, that's definitely a common theme that runs through a lot of what we do. And then the other theme is, uh, 
it's it's very related to long termism, and it's, and it's this idea of kind of X factors for the for the long term future. This idea that there could be there could be dramatic societal transformations that kind of affect everyone all the way into the future. And an example of this is like if you had gone back three hundred years and you were trying to do charity or philanthropy just before the Industrial Revolution. You know, I think the Industrial Revolution ended up being an incredibly important thing that happened that had incredibly large impacts on standard of living, on poverty, on everything else. I think in retrospect, it, it probably would have been a better idea to be thinking about like if you were in the middle of that or, or just before it, how it was going to play out and, and how to make it go well or poorly um, instead of, for example, you know, alms, instead of, for example, like giving money to, you know, to the low income people to reduce suffering in, in the immediate situation. And so when we look at global catastrophic risks and, you know, to some extent at breakthrough science as well, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at ways that we can just affect an enormous number of persons by kind of taking these things that could could be these high leverage moments that could affect it could affect the whole future. And so, you know, our interest in AI, our interest in pandemic, our interest in science, a lot of it pertains to that. So I know you've uh, been working on a series of articles about the history of philanthropy, looking at really big wins that philanthropists have had in the past, and I guess potentially some some failure stories as well. Is there anything you've learned about that on in terms of which focus areas tend to tend to be successful and which ones uh, tend not to? Sure. Yeah, I think we've learned a ton from the history of philanthropy, and we have a, you know a whole bunch of blog posts about it, and we've started a little bit of a grant making program where we actually fund or contract with historians. Um, so you know what what we initially did is we just took this case book. Uh, this case book for the Foundation of Great American Secret is, I believe, what the book is called. And it's got these two-page sort of vignettes of 100 different philanthropic successes. And I kind of read through them and looked for patterns, and we made a blog post about that. And then, you know, what we started doing is taking some of the more interesting-seeming ones and asking and, and paying historians to go and really check them out and say, what really went down here? Was philanthropy really that effective and really that important? And then there's some others we've been able to learn about independently just by reading books and whatnot. And I think we've, yeah, we've learned a ton. I mean, I think... I mean, what, one of the philosophies that I think history of philanthropy has pushed us toward is what we call hits-based giving, and that's the idea. It's, it's again, it's, it's a very different school of thought from GiveWell. Um, the idea of hits-based giving is, is a little bit similar to venture c- capital, which is that you, um, you know, rather than trying to exclusively fund things that you think will probably work, what you do is you fund a whole bunch of things that individually each one might have, let's say, a 90% chance of failing and a 10% chance of being a huge hit. And then out of 10, you might get nine miserable failures, one huge hit, and then the huge hit is so big that it justifies your whole portfolio. So, you know, I was definitely pushed toward this vision of giving by reading these case studies because even though the case studies are cherry-picked, when you see, you know, some of the examples I saw, like the, the Green Revolution, I think one of one of the most important humanitarian developments in, in all of history, um, certainly in the last century, and looks like it was you know largely a philanthropy story. When you look at the pill, also just incredibly revolutionary and important, and largely you know largely the result of a feminist philanthropist. You know, you just say, boy, I could fail a lot of times, um, and if I got one of those hits, I would still be p- feeling pretty good about my philanthropy. So that you know, I think when I read through this stuff, I was initially surprised at how successful things had been, just how big some of the big successes were. And that's not to say there's no failures, because I think there's a lot of failures. Um, So that was one of the first things we took away. Also, a lot of the interest in scientific research, a lot of the interest in policy and, you know, and advocacy. Those are things I think philanthropy really has a track record of doing well in. More recently, Luke Muehlhauser did a study of, you know, how philanthropy has contributed to the growth of academic fields. So there's, I think there's actually, and one, one of the things I learned from it is many times throughout history, Let's say there's, you know, there's, there's a topic that just, for whatever reason, it's not really being discussed much in academia. It's not something professors work on. It's not something students work on. Professors are unlikely to switch into it because they kind of already have their specialty. Students are unlikely to switch into it because there's no professors in there. And a philanthropy comes along, and, you know, one example is the field of geriatrics. A philanthropy comes along and says we think this should be a major academic field and through funding kind of all parts of the pipeline, professors, students, conferences, you name it, we believe they've, they've really been a big part of causing these fields to grow. Um, and so we've tried to look at what they did and learn from it, you know, because we look at the situation today and we say, boy, we wish there was more of a field, for example, around the AI alignment problem. There's a lot of academic researchers working on machine learning and making AI more effective, but in terms of making AI more reliable, robust, safe, in line with human intentions, we wish there was more of a field there. So I think it's been a, a major source of learnings for us. Uh, I've really enjoyed the history of philanthropy case studies that, that the historians we've worked with have written, and just they've given me an enriched picture of what has come before and, and what we can learn from. Do you just want to flesh out those stories of the, of the Green Revolution and, and the invention of the pill? Because 
I, I had no idea that they were funded by philanthropists, and, and you might expect the, that I might know. So perhaps, uh, perhaps <laughs> yeah. people just in general have no idea. Yeah, sure. Um, so on the Green Revolution, uh, you know, I believe this began with the Rockefeller Foundation essentially funding you know, a team of agricultural scientists, among them Norman Borlaug, who would later won the Nobel Peace Prize. And the idea is that they were, you know, they were looking to develop better crops for the developing world. So, you know, kind of U.S. agriculture or whatever developed world agriculture was good at kind of breeding and optimizing crops for the climates they were in, and they wanted to provide kind of a similar service for poorer countries. And what happened was, you know, they developed these crops that were incredibly productive and incredibly, you know, sort of just economically fruitful to work with. And it originally was in Mexico. But, you know, one of the things that I believe happened as a result of this, this eventually scaled up and they started optimizing them for a whole bunch of different countries and climates. And India, you know, at the time this happened was kind of in the midst of a famine. And I believe they went from being a wheat importer to being a wheat exporter. And then there was just this, you know, this massive growth that was kicked off, beginning with the agricultural sector, but then leading to nationwide growth in, in several countries that are, you know, now held up as some of the big examples of countries coming out of poverty in the 20th century. And so, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, there have been estimates that, that a billion uh, deaths from starvation were prevented by these kind of new improved crops and, and all the developments that came from that. And it's, it's really hard to think of something that's been more important for human flourishing you know, there, there, there are things you could say, but this really started with a, with a foundation. And I think it's interesting because at the time, I don't think that was the kind of thing that a government funder would necessarily do. So this comes back to my example of how philanthropy can play a really special role in the world. I think governments often, you know, they have a lot of resources, but they may be kind of bureaucratic and they may be kind of, you know, fighting yesterday's battle in some sense, doing the things that are already socially accepted. And I think you know, global poverty reduction was not as big a worldwide priority then. And so philanthropy kind of led the way. The pill to, you know, Catherine McCormick was a, a feminist philanthropist and, and the feminist Margaret Sanger uh, came to her with this idea that, that she knew a scientist who had been working on studies with rabbits um, to see if he could get them to, you know, to, to basically control the, the menstrual cycle and, and control fertility. And, you know, Sanger believed this could be a huge breakthrough for feminism just to, to give women more options and let them, you know, live their lives the way they wanted without having all the biological constraints they had at the time. And again, not the kind of thing government was really excited about. In fact, uh, you know, I believe that they initially they couldn't advertise this as a birth control. I think they um, they advertised it as something else and then they put a warning label on it saying it may prevent, you know, may prevent fertility. Um, I think they're actually... It like prevents period pain or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and I, I think they were required to put the, the label on there, but, but that label was effectively their advertising, the warning label. So it's another example of something that, you know, it wasn't really a major society-wide priority. It wasn't really a government priority. It was at the time, it was something new and edgy and, you know, and, and different. And I think, again, it was like you look at what happened and it was there's there was this neglected research on rabbits and fertility and it got funded by just a private philanthropist not a huge amount of money and boy did it change the world and so you know you when you look forward you got to ask i mean what are the things that they're just you know they're not a worldwide priority today but if the world becomes sort of better off and wiser and more cosmopolitan maybe they could be in the future so you know the way that animals are being treated on factory farms this is not a giant hugely popular cause there's not a lot of government funding trying to do anything about this and so, you know, this is another case where maybe starting with private philanthropy, we start to turn the tide. And so, yeah, that, that, those are kind of some examples. There's also, um, you know, there's philanthropic examples that, that are much more, I would say, debatable in their impact. So uh, there's a book called The Rise of the Conservative Legal Movement by Stephen Tellis, where it's argued that uh, conservatives did like a really, a really outstanding job of philanthropy in terms of effectiveness. And they really changed the public dialogue in the U.S., kind of, you know, for the good or for many decades, which uh, may explain in some ways some of the strange currents of intellectual activity in the U.S. And some people think this is amazing and some people think it's terrible, but it certainly was a big deal. And so I think if you're looking for a lot of impact for your money, you know, trying to think about how some of these hits came about is pretty fruitful. Have you learned any other lessons that you want to uh, point out from, from the history of philanthropy? Yeah, I mean, so from the field building exercise, you know, when we talk about failures, I mean, we, we focus more on successes because we're hits-based and we're trying to understand, you know, there's going to be a lot more failures than successes and there's a lot more ways to fail than there are ways to succeed. So we tried to understand the successes. But, you know, the field building was pretty interesting too because there were a couple examples of fields where it looks like someone tried to build a field in a way that actually stunted the growth of the field. So uh, nanotechnology, and I believe cryonics might have been held up as examples of this in Luke's report, where by coming into a field and creating a lot of hype and media coverage, 
without really building strong connections to the scientific community, people kind of made certain topics taboo and illegitimate and took things that could have had a decent scientific foundation and made them just like impossible to work on in academia. That's a great example of a mistake we really don't want to make with AI research, um, you know, AI safety, AI alignment. So this is something I was really glad to know about. Yeah, I did another episode with uh, Professor Inglesby who mentioned that if you come into an area um, with an interest in one particular area of a field and saying, like, this is much more important than everything else in, in the field, you can potentially really alienate everyone else because you're basically saying, I'm going to try to cannibalize all of your people and all of your grant funding. Uh, and so even if you do think that, like, the, the, the subset of a field that you're particularly interested in uh, is, is more important, you maybe uh, shouldn't announce that and shouldn't suggest any, any hostility to others because you turn people who otherwise might be supporters or at least neutral uh, into adversaries. Is that something that resonates with you? Yeah, it certainly sounds possible. I mean, it's, you know, it's very hard to make all these generalizations, I think, but um, I can certainly see it happening. And I think one of the things that makes it worse is if you're, if you're letting the media and the hype get ahead of the science. I think that that does seem to me intuitively and from these couple of examples, like a good way to antagonize scientists and ultimately the scientists, you know, they're the ones who determine who's getting tenure. They're the ones who determine what's a good career. In my opinion, uh, pitting the media against the scientists is not really a, not really a desirable situation. Okay, so that's something about choosing causes and I, and I guess uh, ways of tackling those, uh, those problems. Uh, let's talk about hiring staff. How do you go about hiring? One of the things that we feel is that is that interviews are incredibly unreliable. I think there's research on this. It's also been our experience. What we want to do is we want to try and uh, simulate working with someone to the greatest extent possible. And so a lot of times when we're hiring, we try and do these little work trials where someone will do you know an assignment that has some value to us. It's often not the most important thing on our plate because we don't want to be reliant on the, on the work trial to get it done, but it's something that has some value to us and we can kind of simulate working together in a collaborative, realistic style. And, you know, I think we've, we've written some, so we have a couple blog posts about how we hired our first program officers. And I think that's, you know, one of the most important uh, decisions, like I mentioned, that a foundation makes, especially the way we operate. I mean, I mentioned that our grant making process, our grant making process is, is really dependent on having one person who's very deep in the field, uh, big time expert and knows what they're doing and is creative and can, you know, propose great things. And so hiring the wrong person would be a big mistake there. And so, you know, we we did a pretty intensive process to hire our program officers. And, uh, you know, a lot of what we looked for is we looked for people who could kind of communicate in a very systematic way so that we understood what arguments they were making and why they wanted to fund what they would fund. Um, and we also looked for people who were incredibly well-connected and well-respected in the field um, because we knew that their greatest source of impact was, or greatest source of input was going to be from other people in the field, other experts. And a lot of the key was going to be to get those people to open up to them um, despite the fact that a lot of those people would want funding. And finally, we looked for people who were very broad. So when we, you know, when we interviewed people for the program officer role, you know, we spoke to some people who kind of, they had been doing one thing and they knew how to do it, uh, whether that's grassroots advocacy or grass tops advocacy, for example. They knew, they knew their thing, but they weren't kind of thinking about all the different pieces of their field and all the different things you could do to push their cause forward and how they fit together. So we, we looked for breadth as well. Yeah, how much autonomy do program officers have? Uh, do, do you usually approve the kind of grants that they suggest, or is it is, is it a bit more a bit more competition for influence? Sure. So the um, the open philanthropy grant making philosophy again in line with hits based giving, in line with trying to you know take big risks and do things that could be amazingly good, even if they might fail a lot of the time. One of the things we want to do is minimize the number of veto points, minimize the number of decision makers, you know, and have kind of the person who knows the field best, has the most expertise, really be in the lead of what they're doing. And that said, we don't want to be too absolutist about it because, you know, we don't have perfect confidence in our hiring decisions. And also philanthropy is, like I said, I mean, it's not necessarily a very intellectually developed field. So most of the people we've hired did not previously work in philanthropy. They have a lot to learn. And so we also need to, you know, we need to kind of hold ourselves accountable and understand where the money's going. And so one of the compromises we found is what we call the 50-40-10 rule, uh, which is that, you know, so we take a, a program officer and we look at their portfolio, which is all the grants they've made. And one of the things we ask them for is that we'd like, we'd like 50% of the grants by dollars to be classified as good. And by good, I mean that the decision makers, the grant approvers, which are myself and Carrie Tuna, kind of affirmatively have been convinced of the case for this grant. That, you know, if, if you sort of took, for example, our grant to Alliance for Safety and Justice, and you started arguing me about it, I feel I could reasonably defend the grant and, and, you know, would sort of own it in a sense. But then another 40% of the portfolio, so bringing us to 90% total, is okay if we mark it as only okay. And what okay means is, like, we can see where the person's coming from, we can see how, if we knew more, we might be convinced it's a good grant, but we don't necessarily buy all the way into it. And then the other 10% of the portfolio is what we call discretionary, where there's, there's actually a, a very stripped-down process and a 
program officer can just send a very short email, and unless we see a major red flag or a downside risk, it, it goes through in 24 hours if we don't respond, and we don't have to have any buy-in to the grant. And so the idea there is that, you know, it's, it's trying to strike a balance. So we look at our portfolio, and half of it we kind of understand, and it's been argued to us, and it's been justified using our somewhat, you know, thorough internal write-ups. And then the other half of it is more like it's, it's an opportunity for the program officer to take the things that would have been harder to convince us of because they took more context and more expertise and just not put in as much sweat and just, you know, get them done anyway. And so that's where we've, you know, we've really tried to empower the program officers in that way. So uh, in the context of still giving, giving advice to our hypothetical uh, billionaire who's starting a foundation, uh, what are the biggest likely mistakes that they might make in hiring? How, how would they end up hiring someone who uh, was a real mistake? I think two of the, I think two of the biggest mistakes to be made in hiring, I think one thing is that, I mean, these both relate to the things I was saying about how we look for program officers. But um, I think that, I mean, you're probably not hiring someone who was doing philanthropy before. Um, and if you do, you're, you're probably hiring someone who's doing it under a much more constrained environment, under a foundation that kind of, you know, had some pre-declared area of focus and knew exactly what it wanted. So the person you're hiring is probably not exactly experienced in exactly the thing that you want them to do. And I think one danger is that they're just going to keep doing what they used to do, keep doing what they're used to doing. And that's why we think it's really important to look for breadth. I think, you know, and I still worry about this even with the people we have because I think it's just, it's very easy, you know, let's say that you're working on farm animal welfare and you work on, you know, you work on vegan promotion, convincing people to go vegan, or you work on corporate campaigns, which is convincing corporations to treat animals differently. Those are very different activities. And a lot of the times the people working on the two things, you know, they don't always have a ton of interaction. They don't always have a lot of common intellectual ground. And you have to ask yourself, is your program officer, you know, are they funding only one of them because that's what they know and that's what they like? Or are they funding only one of them because they made a calculated decision? Or are they funding both of them because they're trying to just compromise with everyone and be on everyone's good side? Or are they funding both of them for good reasons? So I think, you know, having people who can, who can really uh, look at all the different aspects of a field, I think, is very important. And then I think another major, I think the thing that I, I kind of just, like, actually worry the most about with our program officers is um, I do think there's a really challenging dynamic in philanthropy. And I think this makes it, you know, a bit different from other kind of, other kind of areas that, that might be considered reference classes for it is that um, you're out there trying to make intellectual decisions and decide what to do, but practically everyone you're getting advice from and feedback from and thoughts from is someone who either now or maybe in the future is hoping they'll get money from you. And so they don't want to be on your bad side. And so there's, you know, there's this kind of saying, this kind of joke that, you know, once you become a philanthropist, you never again tell a bad joke because everyone's going to laugh at your jokes, whether they're funny or not, because everyone wants to be on your good side. And I think that can be a very toxic environment. I mean, I, I personally am a person who really prizes openness, honesty, direct feedback. I really value it. I really value people who criticize me. But a lot of people that I interact with don't initially know that about me or maybe just never believe it about me. Um, and so if someone is worried to criticize me, I may, you know, unintentionally just just be doing the wrong thing and never learn about it. And so I think one of one of the worst qualities a program officer could have is being someone who people won't tell the truth to. Being someone who doesn't take criticism well, being someone who's overly pushy, overly aggressive, and kind of, you know, is always using the fact that they have some kind of power and they're able to give money to always kind of be the person who's getting praised and getting complimented and laying things out the way they want to be and very bad at sort of making, doing this active listening and encouraging people to share thoughts with them. And I think it's a huge challenge. I mean, I think it's somewhat related to the management challenge of how do you get people to share their honest thoughts with you when they might fear criticism. And we at least want program officers who, who worry about it a lot and who form close enough relationships that they're able to hear the truth from many people. And if they don't, I mean, I wouldn't be very optimistic about the, about the philanthropy there. Given that the, the program officers, they're, they're trying to get quite a lot of money out the door, potentially tens of millions each year, and they might want to make grants to, you know, a dozen, maybe more organizations. And they don't want to say yes to everyone because then they're not adding that much value. So they must look into potentially dozens of organizations each year and they have to follow up on the previous grants. I mean, how do they find the time to, to manage all of this stuff and actually still be like somewhat thorough? Sure. How do program officers find the time? I mean, I think, A, they just they do work really hard. It is a bit of a, you know, it, it's a job with huge opportunities to do a lot of impact. And it's also a very challenging job. We're also, you know, I think in the process of just staffing up a bit to take some of the load off of them for grant renewals, grant check-ins. Um, so, you know, some of our program areas 
already have uh, sort of more than one person where we're, we'll have a, an associate reporting to the program officer and helping them out. Um, and some of them, I think we're, we're going to get there in the future. But, you know, the, the other thing I'd say is that uh, I think a lot of the ideal way to be a program officer is to be very network dependent. Mm-hmm. And so I think one of the things that we encourage people internally to do is to spend a ton of time networking, talking to people. We definitely encourage them to, you know, to go to dinner with people and, and you know, and expense it and, and all that stuff. Um, because I think let's say you work on, you know, farm animal welfare. If you know everyone else who works on that topic and you kind of, you know, all the people are doing the best work. I mean, you know, time to, to be friends with everyone, but you know, all the people who are doing the best work and have the most thoughts um, and you have good relationships with them. You know, I think you can learn a lot just, just by talking and brainstorming. And then a lot of the, you know, what's going to happen if you do that well, in my opinion, is you're going to hear a lot of the scuttlebutt about what the different organizations are good at, what they're not good at, you know, who's the best at each thing, what the biggest needs in the field are. And so that can form a lot of the basis for how you ultimately decide what to prioritize, what to choose, whom to fund. Of course, you know, one of the things that, that makes this challenging for open philanthropy and very different from GiveWell is that, you know, I think a lot of the most valuable information here is exactly the information that people will not tell you unless they trust you. Um, it's information about just, you know, who's good and who's not so good at what they do and what the biggest needs in the, needs in the field are. And sometimes also information about, you know, how to deal with adversaries. So when you're doing political advocacy, you often have people who are against you. And so the, the information people will only tell to people they trust is the key information behind assessing a grant. And a lot of times it comes from a lot of just interpersonal, you know, getting to know people, building trust, forming opinions of people that is not only, you know, not only delicate information, it's, it's information that even if you wanted to explain it all, you couldn't. And so that's why Open Philanthropy really has this emphasis on, you know, we don't want to only fund that which we can explain in writing. That's why we have the 50-40-10 rule. Like, we don't want to only fund that which Holden buys into. And that's also why, you know, we don't have the same approach to kind of, you know, public communications that GiveWell does. We don't try to explain all the reasoning behind each grant. And it does, you know, it's, it's pros and cons. I mean, I think this frees us up to do really creative, high-risk, great things. And I think it also, you know, it, it makes our work in some ways less satisfying, less thorough, less, you know, easy to kind of take apart into its component pieces than GiveWell. Is there a tension between wanting to be, you know, be friends with these people and you know, get their honest uh, opinions and perhaps a bit of gossip out of them as well, and potentially also having to kind of crack the whip with uh, people who you've given grants to about, about their performance? I mean, how much, how much do you follow up and uh, yeah, yeah. pay close attention to potential mistakes that they're making? Yeah, I think it's a huge tension, and I think this is this is one of these fundamental challenges of philanthropy that I you know I wish I had more to say about what to do about it. It continues to be an ongoing topic for us, and there are certain things that we're experimenting with today to try and um, you know try try and do a better job, just you know evaluating ourselves and seeing you know are we are we getting the best information from everyone, and also do we have good relationships with everyone? I think one place that I kind of analogize it to is management. So I think management has some of the same challenges. You're trying to help someone. You want to know how they're doing. You want the truth from them. You're also responsible for evaluating them. That has some relationships to a philanthropist grantee relationship, but there's also some important differences. So it's it's just a you know an example of something that I I think is kind of this open question philanthropy. I, I can't point you to a lot of great things to read about it, but I think it's a really important topic, and it's one of the things that we we want to develop a better view on and share that view with other philanthropists. So you said that uh, one of your goals is to make philanthropy as a whole a bit more of an intellectual exercise. Uh, And I guess you've been writing up some pretty long blog posts about your process for deciding what problems to work on and how you decide how to split uh, resources between different problems. I'll I'll stick up links to to those. Is is that the main reason why you're you're writing uh, those things up in such great detail is to see if you can uh, change change the discussion among other foundations? Well, one of the reasons that we're writing them up in such great detail is because it just, it helps us get better feedback and it helps us get clearer about our own thoughts. So when a decision is important enough, I believe that it is good to just write it down in a way that, you know, you're, you're not using a bunch of esoteric inside language that you, you know, you might be bearing implicit assumptions in there that make sense to you and the people you talk to, but not to others. I think just the process of trying to make it clear and trying to make it for more general audience somewhat raises new questions and clarifies the thinking. And then I also think we've gotten good feedback on some of this some of these thorny questions we work on, you know, by by sending them to people, especially, especially in the effective altruist community for comment. But yes, another thing we're trying to do is document a lot of the thinking behind the tough intellectual decisions we're making. And I think at some future date, I'm hoping that that content, you know, we may have to clean it up. We may have to present it differently because currently it's like it's it's almost academic in tone. It's just very dry. So I don't, you know, I don't think we're in a place right now where 
this stuff is getting into the press and all kinds of philanthropists are reading it and changing what they do. But we do send it to people we have individual contact with. And I could imagine that in the future, it'll become the sort of, you know, the intellectual backbone of, of some more presentable presentation of, you know, what we end up settling on as the right intellectual framework for philanthropy. And we're definitely not there yet. Well, let's talk about one of those uh, more difficult decisions that you have to make as a foundation, yep. which is how, how you split the, the total kind of endowment between different focus areas. What is the, the, the process that you use for doing that? Sure. So this is something we've struggled with uh, a huge amount. So, you know, one of the questions we struggle with that has to do with this is when we're looking at a grant and we're trying to say, should we make this grant or not? One way to frame the question, I mean, once you've put in the time to investigate a grant, one way to frame the question of whether you should make the grant is, would the money do more good under this grant or under the last dollar that we will otherwise spend? And so in other words, you know, if you imagine that you're going to make a $100,000 grant, you can either make the grant or you cannot. And if you don't, then you have 100000 extra dollars. And in some sense, that, that's going to be, you know, that's going to come out of your pot of money at the end. And so we call this the last dollar question, and we try to think about each grant compared to the last dollar we're going to spend. And, you know, this becomes a very challenging problem because initially the way we wanted to think about it is we wanted to just kind of say, let's estimate, you know, let's sort of have a model of how much good per dollar the last dollar does, and let's take each grant and have a model of how much good per dollar that grant does, and then when a grant looks more cost-effective than the last dollar, we'll do it. And that brings us into this domain of making these kind of quantitative estimates of how much good you're doing with a grant. And, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of problems with trying to make these quantitative estimates, and some of them are very well known, but I think some that have, have been, I think, a little bit unexpectedly thorny for us is, is what we call the worldview split problem. And so the, the way to think about that is, Let's say I'm deciding between a grant to distribute bed nets and prevent malaria and a grant to fund cage-free campaigns that will help chickens. And let's say that I find that I can either, I can either sort of uh, help, let's, let's normalize and let's just pretend that, that help is always the same amount. We can help a person for $1,000 or we can help a chicken. We can help a chicken for $1, help 1,000 chickens for $1,000. Which of those is more cost-effective? And I think it really comes down to this incredibly mind-bending question, which is, do you think chickens can feel pain? Do you think they can have good lives? Do you think they count as sentient beings? Do you think they have rights? You know, how do you think about uh, the experiences of chickens and how much you value the lives of chickens compared to persons? And I think maybe the initial answer here is, well, I don't care about chickens. I care about people. But I think the more you think about it, the more this becomes a, a kind of a kind of a mind bending question. Because if you if you care about people more than chickens, on what basis is that? Is it that you you know, value sophisticated behavior is that you value people in your community and why is that and and which of these things might apply to chickens. And the problem is that if you end up deciding that, let's say you value chickens 10% as much as humans, that would tell you that the chicken grant is like much better. Let's say that you don't value chickens at all. That would tell you the human grant is much better. And so when you're trying to draw these, you know, make these estimates of how much good you're going to do or how many people you're going to help or how many persons you're going to help per dollar, you know, a lot of it is is just there's these there's this small number of really tough, mind bending philosophical questions that if you go one way, it says you should put all your money into farm animal welfare. If you go another, it says you should put all your money into global poverty. And maybe if you go a third way, it says, and I know you've had another podcast on this, that you should put all your money into sort of long termism because, you know, there may be a lot of chickens in the world, but there's even more sort of persons in the future um, than there are of any kind in the world. And so you know, that, that is a really tough one for us and, and for a variety of reasons, which we've written up in, in some detail on the web. We haven't been comfortable just picking our sort of, our sort of mid probabilities and, and rolling with them because we haven't been comfortable with the idea that all of the money would just go into one sort of worldview or one sort of school of thought of giving. And one of the reasons we feel that way is, you know, we do believe there's a big gap in the philanthropy world, and we believe that we have special opportunities to help on a whole bunch of different fronts. So we think we have special opportunities to help reduce global catastrophic risks. We think we have special opportunities to help animals, and we think we have special opportunities to help people. And so, you know, to leave really outstanding opportunities to kind of help and change the way people think about things on the table in order so you can put all your money into just one kind of giving um, has not been something that's sit right with us, and, and that's something that we've you know, that we've written about. So we're still, you know, this is just, a, this, this question is just very much in progress. And we have this, you know, blog post kind of laying out how we're now trying this approach where we kind of, 
we think about our giving at a whole bunch of different levels at once. So we think about each grant and how good it is according to its own standards. So we think about how much a farm animal welfare grant helps chickens and how much a global poverty grant helps humans and how much a global catastrophic risk reduction grant reduces global catastrophic risks. And then we also have to have sort of a, an almost separate model of how much money we want to be putting behind the worldview that says global catastrophic risks are most important, how much total we want to be putting behind the worldview that says that humans are most important, and, and how much behind other worldviews. And so I think we have a long way to go on this, and I think we have a lot of work to do, both philosophical and empirical. And one of the reasons that we're on a hiring push right now is I think this could be, you know, this could be a decades-long endeavor to, to really... And, and there is no right answer, so that the idea is not that there's going to be, like, one set of numbers that is in some sense correct, but just to come to very well-considered positions on this stuff where we feel we've considered all the pros and cons and we're making the best decisions with, with this very large amount of money um, that we can possibly make under deep reflection and under being, you know, highly informed, that's just a ton of work. And, and uh, I think it's, it's going to be, a, you know, a very long project for us, and, and we've just kind of gotten started on it. So uh, I'll put up a link to your uh, latest blog post from uh, from last month about about this topic of how yeah how you try to uh, split the money between the different the different focus areas. One thing that occurred to me when reading it is that you kind of lay out three archetypal focus areas. One is human welfare today. Uh, one is animal welfare today, and another is uh, the long term future or human, humans around in the future. Do you worry that the split could end up being influenced by kind of an arbitrary way in which you're categorizing these things? So you could divide them up differently. You could have uh, you know humans alive today. Uh, animals alive today, and then humans alive in the 22nd century, humans alive in the 23rd century, humans alive in the 24th century, or you could split up, you know, humans alive today by country or something like that. Uh, and it's not entirely clear that like there's three clusters here, or that that's that's the natural way of, of cutting it up. And perhaps like by defining three different things, you're suggesting that well, the the, the split that you will start adjusting from is one third for each of them. Do you see my concern? Oh sure, yeah, no, I, I definitely think so. I mean, I, I think that that. Um one one of the challenges of this work is that it's you know we're trying to we're trying to kind of list different worldviews and then we're trying to come up with some sort of fair way to distribute money between them. But we're aware that the the concept of worldview is a very fuzzy idea and it could be defined in a zillion different ways. And um, you know I mean I can I can tell you how we've tried to tackle it so far. I mean first off, there's questions we we, we struggle with where it feels like there's just like part of me wants one answer and part of me wants another answer. And it's just an intuitive thing that it just, you know, I don't feel like I struggle a lot with how I value the 25th versus the 26th century. Um, I think I probably should either value both of them a lot or just like, you know, or for one reason or another, many of them epistemological rather than philosophical, for one reason or another discount those, you know, those very far centuries that I have a very hard time understanding or predicting. And same with animals where, you know, I feel like there's, there's kind of one side of my brain that wants to use a certain methodology for deciding, you know, how much moral weight to give to chickens and how much moral weight to give to cows and all that stuff. And it'll use that methodology. And then there's another side of my brain that says that methodology is silly and, and we shouldn't do radically, you know, radically unconventional things based on that kind of very weird suspect methodology of pulling numbers out of thin air on how you value chickens versus humans. So some of this is just purely intuitive. And, you know, a lot of philanthropy ultimately comes down to that. I mean, in the end, as a philanthropist, you're trying to make the world better. There's no objective definition of better. All we can do is we can become as well informed and as reflective and as introspective as we can be. But there's still going to just be these intuitions about, you know, what the fundamental judgment calls are and, you know, what we value. And, and that's how we're going to cluster things. Another way in which we do decide how to set up these worldviews is just practical. So, you know, some of why I wouldn't be very happy with all of the money going to animal welfare is that I think that is, a, you know, animal welfare is, is kind of a relatively small set of causes today. And there are a lot of idiosyncrasies that all those causes have in common. And so if we became all in on animal welfare, our giving would become very idiosyncratic in certain ways. And I think in some ways you could think of that as like muddying the experiment of doing effective philanthropy and, and trying to help effective philanthropy catch on. And so, you know, the, the bottom line is like, I don't have a clean philosophical way of saying exactly what all the questions are and exactly how much money should go everywhere. But what I can do is I can say there's a point of view that says that we should optimize our giving for just the long-term future and for reducing global catastrophic risks. And I noticed that if we put all the money into that view, we would have certain problems, both practical and just intuitive philosophical perhaps problems. And so maybe maybe we want some sort of split there and then I can look at a similar split with the with the animal stuff. So it's it's a mix of practical things and, and just very gut intuitive things. But yes, we don't believe that we've got 
any objective answers to how to define good, how much good is being done per dollar. What we do believe we can do is be very informed, very reflective about these things and consider all the arguments that are out there, consider them systematically, put our reasoning out so that others can critique it. Um, and we think that's a, you know, a big step forward relative to the default way of doing philanthropy, which is really just to go with, you know, what kind of before any reflection, before any investigation feels interesting and, and passion, you know, passion compatible to you. So we, we think it's a big improvement, but we, yeah, we're not, we can't turn this into a real science. There's no way. When it comes to deciding the splits, do you find in your mind that you start with a kind of an even split and then move from there? Or do you start from, we'll give, we should give 100% of it to the most cost effective one and then, you know, kind of adjust down from there based on considerations that suggest that you should split more evenly? Well, sort of the question here is what does cost effectiveness mean? So, I mean, I certainly, you know, in general, if, if we could agree on a definition of cost effectiveness, I would always want to give to the most cost effective thing. The question is more about methodology. The question is more about do you feel that the right way to estimate cost effectiveness is to, for example, write down your best guess at the moral weight of each animal and then run the numbers? Or do you feel that it's, you know, to allow certain more just more kind of holistic intuitions about what to do um, enter into your thinking? So, yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, I think the question is about what cost effectiveness is. I think I'm, I'm definitely inclined to do the most cost effective thing if I could figure out what feels cost effective to me. And cost effectiveness means good accomplished per dollar. And so it's entangled with my idea of what's good. And, and that's the intuitive idea. That said, I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, I guess I guess my intuition does sort of start in a 50 50 place, although we've tried to list the reasons that it shouldn't be 50 50. So. You know, I think one one of the concepts we talk about in our post is let's say you're deciding between the you know the sort of long termist view that you should optimize for the long term future and the near termist view that you should optimize for kind of impact you'll be able to see in your lifetime. You can ask yourself one question, which is if I reflected on this and an inordinate amount, and and if I were possibly way more self aware and intelligent than I actually am, what do I think I would conclude, and what's the probability that I would end up deciding that long termism is correct or near termism is correct? So that might give you not a 50-50 split. That might give you like an 80-20 or a 70-30. Um, and then there's these other things we put in there too, which is like you should take into account, you know, perhaps even if one worldview is less likely, there's more value to be had if it's correct. There's more outstanding giving opportunities. There's, you know, there's a lot we're putting in there. And I, I, I certainly, we're not just going to end up going even split, but I, I think there is some intuition to go there by default that we try to counteract by listing counter considerations. If you think that there's really sharp declining returns in some of these kind of boutique focus areas, uh, like perhaps artificial intelligence or, or factory farming, then that could suggest that, in fact, it doesn't really matter exactly like what kind of split you get between them. As long as you're giving some to those focus areas, then then that's where most of the good is going to get done. So, so is it possible that maybe you shouldn't spend too much time uh, fussing about the details if you're going to kind of split it somewhat evenly anyway? Uh, I think in some ways that was the attitude we took at the very beginning when we were picking causes. And I think that attitude probably made more sense when we were early and we just we wanted to get experience and we wanted to do things. We didn't want to hold everything up for the perfect intellectual framework. And we're certainly not holding things up. I mean, we're, we're giving substantial amounts. But, I, you know, I think at this time, I mean, I think it is true that we can fund the best opportunities we see today in AI and in biosecurity without, you know, getting that close to tapping out the whole amount of capital that's available. That is certainly true. But there's a question, A, of what kind of opportunities will exist tomorrow. So, you know, one of the things we do as a philanthropist is we do field building and we try to we try to fund in a way that there will be more things to fund in the future than there are in the present. And so that's, you know, that's one complication there is just imagining, you know, there may actually be a lot of things to spend on at some future date. And then another thing is, you know, one of the things that, that I find kind of mind bending is is thinking about, you know, there's there's probably something you can do for every worldview. It may not be as good as the best opportunities, but it's still something. And so, you know, if you believe that, uh, as, as you covered in other podcasts, if you believe that there's so much value in the long term future, you might believe that, you know, relatively sort of intuitively low impact interventions, like, let's say, directly funding surveillance labs in the developing world to prevent pandemics, you might still believe that in some mathematical sense is doing more good in expectation and helping more persons than even, you know, very effective sort of science that's wiping out very terrible diseases. Um, and so what you do with that observation when you could do something that, you know, really feels intuitively outstanding and impressive and helps a lot of people versus something that feels intuitively kind of low leverage, but according to some philosophical assumptions could actually be much better. And that's one of the things that we're struggling with at this time. So what kind of wins have you had so far? Are there any things that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, it's, it's early days, so it's only been a couple of years that we've really been giving at scale. And I think in general, I think of the time frame as uh, for philanthropy as being somewhere between like five and 20 years to really hope to see impact. So we're not at a stage where I would necessarily be 
you know, let's say demanding to see uh, some of our hits yet. But I do think we're starting to see the, you know, the early hints of, uh, of things working out in kind of this hits-based framework. I think the area where that's been most true is farm animal welfare. So, you know, that's, that's been a really interesting case because I think it's an incredibly neglected cause. And so, you know, you probably talked with Lewis about this, but there, there are these animals being treated incredibly terribly, and they could be treated significantly better for very low costs on the part of the fast food companies and the grocers. So, you know, going from caged chickens, battery cages, to cage-free chickens is, is a very low cost. I think it's like a few cents a dozen eggs or something like that. And just the corporations don't do it because just no one cares and no one is even bringing it up. And so, you know, when you fund these corporate campaigns, you can get big impact. And, you know, we believe we came in when there were already a couple wins, there was already some momentum. But, you know, we do believe that we were a part of helping to accelerate the corporate campaigns. And, you know, fairly shortly after we put in, you know, a large amount of money, uh, we saw just this wave of pledges that swept all the fast food companies and all the grocers in the U.S. So hopefully, you know, a couple decades from now, you won't even be able to get eggs that aren't cage-free in the U.S. And so, you know, the, the impact there in terms of the number of animals helped per dollar spent already looks like pretty inordinate. And, you know, it, it's hard to say exactly what our impact was because the momentum was already there. But, you know, I do, I do think of that as, as sort of an early hit. And meanwhile, you know, we're also funding farm animal work, work in other countries where things are less far along because we want to, we also want to seed the ground for those future wins. And we want to, you know, we want to be there for the tougher earlier wins too. You know, in criminal justice reform, we have seen some effects as well. We picked that cause partly because we thought we could get wins there. So it's another one where it's been on a slightly shorter time frame. There was a big bipartisan bill in Illinois that we think will have a, a really big impact on incarceration in Illinois. It was a, you know, something that we believe is, is partly attributable to our funding. And we're probably going to check it out through our history of philanthropy project at some point just to kind of check ourselves and better ourselves. And, you know, I think in some of our other causes, I mean, well, I mean, the world hasn't been wiped out by a pandemic, so that's good. I mean, <laughs> I think some of our global catastrophic risk reduction cause, it's it's much harder to point to impact. Um, the nature of the cause is is less amenable to that. I think that is some reason that it's good for that not to be the only kind of cause that we're in. Um, and we have to assess our impact. They're born by intermediate stuff. So with AI, you know, we're, we're happy if we see more people doing AI safety research than used to be doing it, especially if they're doing it under our funding, which, which is, is the case at this time, but it's an intermediate thing. What are some other approaches that different foundations take that you think uh, you know, are interesting or that you respect or, or, or have some, uh, some successes in their, in their history? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, we have a certain philosophy of giving and, you know, we've kind of tried to emulate a lot of the parts we liked of other foundations, but there's a lot of really different schools of thought out there that also be very effective. So our, our, our kind of philosophy is, is work really hard to pick the causes, work really hard to pick the people. And from there, try to, you know, minimize decision makers and emphasize autonomy for the program officers and, you know, kind of have each thing be done by the person who knows the field best, kind of having a lot of freedom. And I think we also take the same attitude toward our grantees where, you know, by default, the best kind of giving we can do is to find someone who's already great, already quite aligned with what we're trying to do and just support them with very few strings attached. I think you do see some other models that are are really interesting. So I think... uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think, has had a huge amount of impact, and, and I, you know, I find a lot of what they do really impressive, and a lot of it has been, you know, I think in many ways more kind of driven, it's, it's been a little bit more, in, in some sense, um, in some sense, top down. So I, I would say, you know, they, they've kind of come up with what they want major decision makers such as governments to do, such as put more money into highly cost-effective things like vaccines, and they've just kind of gone out and really gone gone lobbying for it or, you know, soft lobbying, making the case for it. And I think, I think their, you know, their work has been a bit more prescriptive. They, they have their thing they want to happen and they try to push it to happen. They do everything and, and they're very big, but I think a lot of their big wins have looked more like that and less like, you know, let's say RK tree work where we saw something that was already going on and we just kind of tried to pour gasoline on it in a sense. The Sandler Foundation is, is kind of different in a different direction, and, and we've written about them on our blog. One of the things they do differently from us is they're just very opportunistic. So we try to develop these focus areas that we become very intense about, and we have people who are just obsessed with them and experts with them. And, you know, the Sandler Foundation is more like they have a whole bunch of things that they would fund if the right person or the right implementation came along. And so they, they kind of, you know, they funded Center for American Progress, they funded ProPublica, they kind of were, were startup in, in both of these, and, and Center for Responsible Lending. And, you know, a lot of it is like there's a whole bunch of things they could do at any given time, and they're not all united by one cause, and they're just waiting for the right team to come along. And they operate on a very small staff, I think just like a few people. So that's interesting. Then there are foundations that are more, you know, more kind of operating. Um, so foundations that are kind of 
doing the work themselves, um, doing the advocacy themselves, and doing the, you know, the Kaiser Family Foundation, I think, was was originally maybe set up as a grant maker and essentially became a think tank. And I think all those foundations have had, you know, really interesting impact. You know, and then and then a final one, the, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. They're, they're a science funder, and I think they've got just like this kind of different philosophy from most of what we do, although we do some things like this. But their philosophy is kind of rather than trying to identify where you're going to see the most impact in terms of lives improved and kind of back chain from there, a lot of what they do is they, you know, they just believe in uh, basic science. They believe in breakthrough fundamental science. They believe in better understanding the basic mechanisms of biology. And they have this program that kind of, you know, it's, it's a program, it's an investigator program that's set up to identify outstanding scientists and give them you know, a certain amount of funding. And I think it tends to be pretty similar from scientist to scientist. And we, you know, we do have some work on breakthrough fundamental science, but they have just an incredibly prestigious program. They've been early to fund a lot of Nobel laureates and, and, you know, they really have specialized their entire organization around basic science, which is, you know, a little bit of a different frame than most of what we do, although we have some, some of that going on too. How do you expect that you'll be able to, to change policy? And, and has that changed since the 2016 election? Sure. So, um, you know, I think I, I think the way we like to think of it is that we we try to empower organizations that can have a productive effect on the policy conversation. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do that. So we we, we have a, a blog post, an old one called uh, I think it's called the role of philanthropic funding in politics. And you know, so, something you can do is you can just fund people to develop ideas, new policy ideas that may be kind of a, a new way of thinking about an issue. Um, that is different from you know, for example, funding elections. You can also fund you know grassroots uh, grassroots advocacy. So you can fund people who are organized around a common population or a common topic like formerly incarcerated persons. And, you know, you can just support these people to organize and to work on issues they're passionate about and, and see where that goes. You know, you can, you can also fund sort of think tanks that try to, try to kind of broker agreements or try to take the new ideas that are out there and try to make them more practical. So I think there's, there's a whole bunch of different things philanthropists can do. And a lot of the time, the longer term and higher risk in some ways, the, the bigger impact you can have. So this book I mentioned before, The Rise of the Conservative Legal Movement, really argues that by focusing more on the upstream intellectual conversation end, that certain funders had a lot of influence on politics that they couldn't have had if they just tried to jump in on an election and start funding candidates, where, you know, the candidates kind of already know what they think and what they believe, and you can kind of pick from a very small set of options. And so, yeah, I think I think there's a whole bunch of ways to fund politics, and what we've tried to do is when we pick an issue, we try to pick someone who can see all sides of the issue and see how all the pieces fit together, and it's really different for every issue. Do you think there's good evidence that trying to change the intellectual milieu or, you know, the, the ideas that uh, people in the political scene are, are talking about is more effective? than just funding candidates at the point of an election? Well, I think it's one of these things that's just inherently incredibly hard to measure because you're dealing with, you know, I mean, to, to trace the impact of something like the conservative legal movement over the course of decades on the overall, overall intellectual conversation, I mean, you not only can't do it with randomized controlled trials, I mean, it's really, there's not much you can do in terms of quantitative analysis, period. You kind of just have to, you know, be a historian and ethnographer. And so, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's hard to say. And I think a lot of what we try to do is, Rather, rather than getting everything down to a formula, we try to just be as well informed, as reflective as we can be and work with, you know, with the people who are as well informed and reflective as we can find. And so, you know, when it comes to choosing when are we going for the long term, the big win versus when are we going for the short term, you know, the tractable thing. A lot of that comes down to once we have a cause, we try to pick the person who we think can think about that question better than we can. And then we follow their lead. And that's the program officer. What would you say to a potential philanthropist who wanted to do a lot of good with their money, but their, their, their one condition was that it had to be something that Open Phil wouldn't, wouldn't fund or Good Ventures wouldn't fund? Uh, sure. So, um, I mean, I'm kind of a strange person to ask about this, um, but, <laughs> but I do have some answers nonetheless. First off, there, there are things we just don't fully fund for various reasons. Um, we don't fully fund Give All Top Charities. That's for reasons that have been laid out in great detail in the cost prioritization post. There are organizations where we don't want to be too much of their funding. We put out an annual post on suggestions for individual donors. And so, you know, that that's a possibility. And then, you know, the other thing is th there are these kind of, uh, there's the EA funds, some of which are uh, run by, by people who work at Open Philanthropy. And those are more specifically to give people who work here the opportunity to fund things that Open Philanthropy can't or won't do. And there is some stuff in that category. And so, you know, occasionally we'll be looking at a giving opportunity and we'll say, you know, that, that poses too much of a, let's say, a, a communications or a PR risk or, or there's some other reason or we don't have full agreement among the people who need to sign off on grants, which we, we try to minimize the number of veto points, but sometimes we still won't have agreement. So an example of something is, um, you know, some, something that I, I am somewhat interested in as a philanthropist is the idea of experimenting with, with just like 
experimental individual regranting. So just, you know, taking someone who I think would be interesting if they had a chance to try their own philanthropy and see if they would do it differently from me. And we might have enough in common in terms of values and in terms of worldview and in terms of goals that, you know, that I could feel confident that if we sort of just regrant, just granted a bunch of money to them to regrant, that I could feel comfortable that money would be, you know, not used terribly or the person would work really hard to optimize it. And they might find something much better than what we could do. And if they couldn't, they might give it back. And so, you know, that's something that we've, we've talked about experimenting with, but I think it's, uh, I, I think there are some logistical obstacles and there's also some just like internal, you know, it, it's, it's not necessarily, I, th- I think there's a higher level of excitement, like from me than from some of the other people, such as Carrie and Dustin for this idea. And so we aren't necessarily like experimenting with it at the level or pace that I would, that I would necessarily do if it was my money. And I think that's like a pretty interesting idea is just look around yourself. Is there someone I know who they really might want a shot at being a philanthropist? Who knows what they would come up with? And they have a lot in common with my values. That's something that, that I'd be pretty interested in and that, you know, I've, I've sometimes encouraged people to try out. And one of the big benefits there is that they can just use kind of the, the unique knowledge that they have. That's you know, very hard to communicate. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and one way of one way of putting it is like, you know, if you if you gave if you have, you know, let's let's say just to use some made up numbers, let's say you had a billion dollars and you gave a million to someone um, who you wanted to see what they would do. The idea would be like their first million dollars is better than your last million because, they, you know, it's like they're and in some sense, their ratio of human capital to money spent is going to be extra high for that money. And so they might put extra time into finding things that you don't have time to chase down because you can only run so big of an organization um, without starting to run into organization you know, issues that we don't necessarily want to contend with yet. So I think that's, that's part of the thinking. And yeah, also part of the thinking is this is a, a theme running through open philanthropy, but we don't, when we're doing hits-based giving, we don't expect every good idea to be communicable. Um, we think sometimes you have deep context, you have relationships, you have expertise, you've thought about stuff for hundreds or thousands of hours, and sometimes it's just better to give someone a shot as long as you're controlling the downside risks. Mm. I guess if you had billions of dollars to invest um, as a for-profit vehicle, you probably wouldn't, you know, found a conglomerate and then decide, you know, what businesses do we want to run as this enormous conglomerate? You would, like, give it out to lots of different entrepreneurs who could start businesses. Right. You would invest yeah. in, a, in a bunch of different, you know, folks, which is what people do. Okay. Let's shift gears for a minute and talk more about um, artificial intelligence safety, which I think is one of the focus areas that, that you're most involved in, right? Yep. What are the main categories of work on, on AI that you're involved in funding or supporting? Sure. So, um, yeah, we think uh, we think potential risk for advanced AI is a really great philanthropic opportunity in a sense because we think it's very important, very neglected, a um, little bit less sure of the tractability, uh, but but there you are. So, you know, some of the things that we do in this area. First off, just to just to set the stage a bit, I, I don't know if you've had previous or future podcasts on this, but um, you we've know, had a few, but yeah. maybe not everyone's heard them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, so to set the stage, I mean, you know, we we have a view that it should be certainly possible in principle to develop AI that could be incredibly transformative. And when we when we use the term transformative AI, we're talking about AI that could cause kind of a change in the world that might be roughly comparable to what we saw in the industrial revolution or the agricultural revolution. So, you know, I think I think sometimes when people talk about AI and they kind of make fun of the idea of a singularity, like this dramatic change in the world that that kind of sounds kind of eschatological, I don't think we're, you know, we're we're not necessarily looking at what one might call singularity, but we might look at um you know, a level of world transformation that does have historical precedent and is incredibly dramatic. Um, and so, you know, the Industrial Revolution is something that, you know, the world changed incredibly fast and it's almost like unrecognizable afterwards compared to beforehand. And we think AI could bring about that kind of change. The reason for that is that we think, you know, when those giant transformations happen, a lot of the times the reason is dramatic changes in technology, dramatic changes in what's possible and how the world works. And that's, you know, that's a lot of why humans have had kind of the outsized impact on the planet that we have, why we've driven a lot of other species extinct, despite the fact that we're, you know, quite unimpressive compared to a lot of those animals, physically speaking. And so, you know, when we think about AI, we think about the, the things that humans do in order to develop new technologies and in order to de- transform the planet according to their wishes, for better or worse, the things human do, humans do, um, you know, it seems definitely possible in principle to us that they could be done sort of, the same things could be done faster and more effectively if they could be implemented in a computer that was, you know, kind of carrying out in some sense the same information processing, the same inference, the same science, but with a great deal more computing power. And so, you know, the other thing is that when we when we look at the details of the situation, and this is something that I, I don't think we'll have time to 
get into detail here, but when we look at kind of just our technical advisors, what they think and our read of the situation, we think it's um, actually somewhat likely that this could happen fairly soon. So the, the, the kind of the whole field of AI or computer science is only a few decades old, only something maybe like 60 years old. And we could imagine that, you know, m- maybe not likely, but, but definitely possible, something like at least 10% probability that sometime in the next 20 years, we could kind of reach a threshold where AIs are able to do incredibly transformative things. They don't necessarily need to be able to do everything humans can do. But if you had an AI that, for example, could, you know, could sort of do science, could read the existing scientific papers, propose experiments and do science and greatly accelerate science, that could be sort of transformative. And, and we do think that is something that is somewhat likely, you know, in, in, in the sense of non-trivially likely, in the sense of 10% or more. And, you know, 10% or more in the next 20 years, a lot of people would look at that and say, who cares? But as a hit-space philanthropist, we work on very long time frames, and we're happy to work on things that, you know, may be less than 50% likely to have an impact, but they do have an impact, it'll be huge. So when we look at the situation of, you know, the world could change in this kind of very dramatic and, and global and sort of irreversible way, and it could happen in the next 20 years, then we start to think to ourselves, well, if there's something we could do to help the world be more prepared for that transition, so that it happens in a way that's safer, um, that is more conducive to human empowerment, then, you know, we, we could imagine this becoming a win, kind of the size of some of the wins I talked about before with the, the Green Revolution and whatnot, and that could be, you know, that fits very well into the hit-space giving framework. So then the question becomes, what can we do if, if this is going to happen? And again, we think it's only a decent chance. Is there anything a philanthropist could do to make it more likely that this happens in a good way instead of a bad way? And so then that, that gets to our picture of what the AI risks are. And, you know, one, one thing about AI is that if, if you have this AI that is sort of helping you do science at an accelerated rate, helping you develop new technologies, in some ways, you know, that is a source of power, and that could be a source of concentration of power, potentially, depending on the exact details of how AI develops and, you know, what order it occurs in. And, you know, you could imagine something happening, like with AlphaGo, where, where something went from not being able to beat any professional humans to being able to essentially crush any prof- all professional humans in the span of a few months. You could imagine that, you know, if, if you had sort of an equivalent of that for doing science, you could imagine, a, you know, a situation somewhat analogous to the beginning of the Cold War, where there was you know, just a couple of countries that were ahead of everyone else on a certain branch of science, and that gave them sort of inordinate power and, and kind of concentrated power, and it was very scary. And you could imagine this happening with AI, that this this could be one of these technologies that developing it, you know, faster than others causes power for, for a time to concentrate and, you know, to become imbalanced. And so that's, you know, that's one risk that we see, and, and we refer to misuse risk as the risk that, you know, let's say that there's a, you know, a state that, that uses uses advanced technologies that come from advanced AI for ends that we think are, you know, not not conducive to human flourishing. Um, so that's the misuse risk. And then the other risk we see from AI is what we call accident risk, which is, you know, the AI itself, if it's, you know, if it's sort of given a, uh, a cost function or an objective function that is sort of not very well designed or just like a little bit carelessly designed or just isn't perfectly capturing um, what we really hope to be optimizing for, you know, I think we could end up with sort of uh, essentially, for the first time ever, an intelligence that is able to do things, really important things and really broad scope things that humans can't, that also wants something that's opposed to human flourishing. And this has been, you know, spelled out at some length, this idea in the book Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom, so I won't go too much into it. But we think it's, you know, it's an area where we can imagine technical research really making it easier to build an AI that we can be confident is going to, you know, is going to essentially help humans accomplish the things they're trying to accomplish instead of kind of pursuing some degenerate, you know, some degenerate objective function and maybe causing a lot of damage. So that's how, that's kind of how we see the risks broadly. And I can go into more detail on this, but broadly how I would describe our intervention, I would describe our core intervention as field building. So, you know, it is even on a 20 year time period, which, which I think is a bit, you know, is, is a little bit aggressive. And we're saying there's, you know, at least a 10% probability of it. But even on a 20-year time period, that's a, you know, a really hard time period to really make plans about. And this is a technology that doesn't exist yet. And so you know, we should not be confident in our ability to know the future. We shouldn't be saying that AIs will be designed in very particular ways and doing very particular things. That's not what our attitude is about. But we do believe that the world will be better off if this happens. The world will be a lot better off if there's already a large, robust, excellent field of experts who have spent their careers thinking, you know, very deeply about what could go wrong with AI and what we could do to prevent it. And so, you know, for this example, this this accident risk that Nick Bostrom writes about, 
you know, if we develop extremely powerful AI in 20 years and there's this field of, you know, maybe hundreds, thousands of people who have just been thinking about the different ways AI can go wrong and how to build a robust and safe and aligned AI, we think we'll be a lot better off than if we're kind of under the status quo where there's this like very small fringe sort of sub community that thinks about it. And, you know, similarly for some of the some of the misuse risk and the, the geopolitical challenges. We think if, if people have been thinking about what kind of imbalance of power could be created, how it compares to the situation with nukes, how it's different, we think the world will be better off than if it just catches everyone by surprise and everyone's scrambling to just improvise, you know, a way to, to, to navigate this situation peacefully. And so, you know, our intervention is field building. And as I mentioned earlier, um, field building is something we think philanthropy has a track record of doing. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do. We want there to be more people who have made it their life's calling and their life's career to think about how things might go if there was a very sudden transition to a very powerful AI. And that's, you know, that that's our kind of bet on, on how to help. So what kind of things could you fund or, I mean, what developments could there be in the whole AI space in general that you think would make the make the biggest difference in the next couple of years? Sure. So, um, you know, the, I'm going to divide it up again into uh, kind of te- the technical front and maybe the, the more geopolitical or strategy side. So on the technical front, you know, the thing, the thing that, I, that I said we want to see is we'd like there to be a, a major academic field of people who are, you know, basically doing technical research that reduces the odds of, of a really bad accident from AI. And, you know, an example, so some of the examples of the work that's been done on this. So, you know, one, one challenge uh, that, that you, you could imagine leading to a, a very bad accident with AI is um, you know, the current kind of reinforcement learning systems, deep reinforcement learning systems. It's like you kind of have to hard code what their objective is. So you, you, you take something and you say, well, let's say, for example, whenever you're going to play this game over and over again, this Go game, and whenever you get more stones or, or controlled spaces than the opponent, that's good. And whenever you get less at the end of the game, that's bad. And if you define good and bad in this very clean, tight, algorithmic way, then, you know, from there, the AI is able to very kind of cleverly and intelligently learn how to get that outcome. So it knows what outcome it's trying to get, and it becomes very good at getting it in these very creative ways that use a lot of things that look a lot like human creativity and intuition. You can imagine this becoming a problem if in the future AIs are very powerful and very broad scope, and you might have a situation where, you know, a very well-defined objective, like maximize the amount of money in this bank account, is something that AIs can find very clever and very creative ways of doing and, and maybe also illegal and maybe also damaging <laughs> and bad. Whereas if you try and give the AI a goal like, hey, can you please stop other AIs from mucking things up? That's a poorly defined objective and, and, and you aren't able to give it the same kind of pattern of learning from reward and punishment and learning how to optimize. And so there is this you know, very nascent field that one might, one might call reward learning, which is trying to transmit these kind of fuzzy, poorly defined human ideas of what we want to AIs so that the AIs are optimizing for things that we ourselves don't know how to describe, but we know them when we see them. There's a paper that was a collaboration between OpenAI and DeepMind on this, uh, learning from human preferences, where they kind of, you know, they had humans kind of say, just kind of say, I know it when I see it. And they looked at the behavior an AI was doing, and they kind of manually trained the AI to do things that, like a backflip, that they, they knew how to recognize, they didn't know how to algorithmically describe. And there's, there's other kinds of, you know, there's other areas of reward learning, like inverse reinforcement learning, which is kind of inferring an agent's reward function from its behavior. You know, there's another category, another, another thing that might cause a bad accident is that uh, a lot of AIs, they're very good at making decisions as long as what they're seeing is similar to what they've seen before in some sense. So they were, they were trained on a certain set of inputs, and that's how they learned. Let's say they looked at a bunch of images that had cats and dogs in them, and that's how they learned how to tell apart cats from dogs. And then if you show them completely new images that come from a different set, maybe they have some new Instagram filter on them, they may behave in extremely strange ways. And so there's this, you know, there's this idea of adversarial examples uh, where you can, you can design images that look for all the world like a dog, but will be classified by an AI with perfect confidence as an ostrich. And that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that you can imagine something that is very smart and is sort of able to come up with clever, creative, high technology ways to do things if it kind of breaks in this way where it's doing completely the wrong thing because it's in an unfamiliar situation. Learning how to deal with adversarial examples and build AIs that can't be screwed with in that way would be really nice. And so one of the things in the next two or three years is I'd like to see more top AI researchers who are spending their lives on something like the adversarial examples problem or the reward learning problem. And, you know, one of the one of the things that we're hoping to do is we fund 
professors um, to work on problems like these. And then we're also funding, we have an AI fellows program where we're choosing uh, winners as we speak for, for more junior students to be able to say, hey, I can make a whole career out of this. Why don't I start now? Um, so I think that's, you know, that's a major area where, where I think things could, could be a lot better. And, you know, one of the roles we're hiring for is, is directly related to that. And then, you know, the other areas is kind of the other thing I talked about, the misuse, the geopolitical risks. And that's where, you know, I think it's... Um, simultaneously could be kind of silly, but also could be very important for people with a lot of knowledge of international relations and politics and, you know, um, geopolitics to to kind of game out. I mean, what happens if there's a sudden increase in technological development capabilities because of AI and it doesn't come to all the countries at the same time in the same way? What is the result of that going to be? And are there agreements or preparations we can make in advance so that that, you know, is, is kind of a less destabilizing, world destabilizing situation? So again, I mean, that's where we are actively looking for people who we you know, who we think can devote a career to kind of gaming that out, thinking about what the implications of that might be. And we are already sort of seeing the growth of, you know, people who are policy analysts on on other AI risks, on, you know, risks, for example, of unemployment. Um, For us, the highest stakes are kind of in the things I described and the things where it seems most important to get ahead of the curve and not respond to them as they're happening. Um, So finding people who are going to devote their lives to these things, very high on our list of things we want to see happening. So you mentioned uh, two different uh, potential hires there, someone focused on technical work and someone focused more on policy uh, and you know, international relations. C- can you go into a bit more detail of you know, exactly the kind of, kind of people that you're, that you're looking to hire there in case someone who's listening might, might be suitable? Yeah, for sure. So on the technical research side, you know, one of the challenges we have is that there, there are a bunch of people who are working on you know, technical agendas relevant to AI safety and AI accidents. So there's you know, Machine Intelligence Research Institute, uh, doing their research. There's Future of Humanity Institute doing theirs. There's a nonprofit called OTT that we're working on a grant to um, that does something else. There's, you know, various academic labs that we funded. There's the Center for Human Compatible AI at Berkeley. And it's it's kind of a growing field. And the thing that there isn't right now is anyone who's making it their, their full-time job to understand the pros and cons and the weaknesses and strengths of all these different lines of research and, and the adversarial examples too. And the work going on at the labs, OpenAI, DeepMind, Brain, etc., And so, you know, you have a lot of researchers who are, you know, they're working on their thing, they're working on their technical path, and they might be somewhat aware on the side of other people's work, but they're also very busy because they're doing their own research. And the thing that we would love is someone who's just, their entire job is to understand, you know, at a technical level, what is the technical problem being solved what are some of the algorithms that have been come with to solve it? What are they doing well? What are they not doing well? How could this lead to an AI that is robustly aligned and that we have nothing to worry about from in terms of accidents? And how could this fail to lead to that? And, and what else might we need? And I think if that person existed, A, they would be really useful to AI researchers trying to figure out what to focus on because they would know kind of, you know, which lines of research look especially neglected or especially promising and which ones seem like a good fit for different people based on their skills. And I think these people could also advise us really usefully to help us determine, you know, where should our biggest priorities be? What kind of researchers should we be looking for? Should we be spending more time looking for kind of people with a security background, with a math background, with an ML background? And they could really advise us because we have a, we have a lot of different ways we can do things. Our current AI technical safety team, you know, really has its hands full just designing funding mechanisms. So, you know, ways to, you know, provide fellowships and grants to academic researchers and ways to source the researchers and make sure we fund the the people who are interested in this work. Someone who could really specialize in just like digging in on these technical agendas and helping us understand which ones are most important to support and which lines of research are most promising to get more feedback on and to provide more support for, that would be uh, really excellent. Is anyone really qualified to answer those questions? Or is it just a matter of, you know, no one really knows, but some people will have better guesses than others? Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely the latter. And, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a common theme in open philanthropy's work is, you know, we're doing philanthropy. So, so there aren't conclusive answers to any of these questions. But, you know, a, a driving idea of open philanthropy is that if you take something really seriously and you spend your life trying to understand all the considerations and you make a considered judgment, that's probably better than if you kind of have thought about something for 10 minutes or thought about it for an hour, maybe even thought about it for a week. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think we're ever going to have the answer. You know, it's, it's, science is hard to predict, especially, and hard to evaluate. But it would be really great if there was just someone who lived and breathed this stuff. And I would, if they did, and they, you know, seemed to have kind of reasonably good judgment and answered questions well, I would definitely trust their opinions 
on who's doing especially exciting research that needs to be amplified, I would trust their opinions more than my own. And I would trust them more than, you know, than the people today, frankly, who are very bright. But um, I think someone who spent that kind of time on this stuff, I think would I, w- I would put more weight on their view. And I think that would be to the benefit of our funding and, and researchers' uh, career choice and other things. So I heard, heard in the grapevine that you're also considering hiring someone who would become a world expert on, uh, you know, what, when we should expect AI to be able to do different things. So looking at like timelines of development of artificial intelligence capabilities. Is that, is that right? Yep, that's absolutely right. So that's, you know, that's another topic where uh, I look at the situation and, you know, open philanthropy has our view that transformative AI is at least like 10% likely sometime in the next 20 years you know, that view is, is based on conversations with our technical advisors and based on some amount of internal analysis. Um, but, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't think we've done a wonderful job on it. Um, I don't think that we have considered all the different arguments and counter arguments, but I don't really think, frankly, that anyone else has either because the task of trying to estimate when AI will be able to do what is just extremely different from the task of doing AI research itself. And I think this is, you know, one of my issues with the, the current dialogue around AI is people say, well, you know, I think AI is really far off, or I think I think transformative AI is coming really soon. What are these statements based on? And I think one of the best things anyone has come up with to base them on is surveys of AI researchers. So you send them all a form, you say, when do you think we'll have, you know, artificial general intelligence or human level or whatever your, you know, preferred term for it is, and then you kind of average the answers. And I think the problem is what you're doing is you're you're basically you're going to people who spend spend their entire lives trying to get today's state-of-the-art algorithms on today's state-of-the-art hardware to do kind of the most interesting and breakthrough thing possible today in some particular subfield. And that just doesn't have a heck of a lot to do with the task of estimating when AI will be able to do what. And I think, you know, when we have talked about the latter topic, we've gotten into a lot of conversations about, like, what, you know, what are we up against here? I mean, if we, if we want an AI to be able to, to do certain things better than a human can, it becomes relevant to look at how much computing power today's top AIs have compared to today's humans and, you know, estimate what is the brain doing equivalently in terms of a computer and, you know, what can we expect from the future in terms of when will we have enough kind of AI hardware to, to run something similar to a mouse or to run something similar to a monkey, run something similar to a human. These are questions that just don't come up if you're trying to build an image classifier or a reinforcement learner that, you know, finds novel ways of beating video games or classifying images. So I think it's it's one of these things where it's just, it's a fundamentally different field. It's a different discipline. I don't believe there's anyone right now who has made it their entire life's calling and their life's work to understand the different arguments about you know, when AI will be able to do what. And I don't think there's something we can have answers on, but I think it's something that if someone, you know, is thinking really hard about all the different facets of the problem and all the different arguments and counter arguments, I would put more weight on their view than on my own. And I'd put more weight on their view than on most others. And I don't think there's anyone like there right now. And, I, and that's something we would love to hire. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised when I heard you were going to hire someone for this because it seemed like it might just be a problem where we'd already done what we could and it was just uh, fundamentally uncertain. But it sounds like you think that there's there's lines of research that haven't been done uh, that we, we've surveyed people who have like some relevant expertise, but not really the most relevant expertise. So, so someone could just become the word expert on this if they spend a few years on it. Yeah, that's roughly how I feel. I, I, I don't, you know, I think, I think there's these questions like the, the ones I was mentioning about how, how you kind of translate what the brain is doing into computing power that they just haven't been studied very much. It's not anyone's job to study them. And a lot of the best analysis I'm aware of today is just like really informal stuff done by people in their kind of spare time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think a- what AI say? impacts is one organization. Yeah, that exactly. Has done yeah. Some of this. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a very small organization. You know, we support them. It's like um, one or two but, people, I think. Yeah, exactly. I think this is this is an incredibly underdeveloped field relative mm-hmm. to like machine learning itself. And you know, I think even so, I mean, so I think there's extra work to be done. There's lots of arguments that haven't been fully you know, reckoned with. And I do believe that. I think a decent counterpoint to this is like, look, you can do all the work you want on trying to understand the brain. Like, it is not possible to predict the future 20 years out. No one's ever done it well. And that's an argument someone could make. And I think it's a decent argument. But I I think there's also a counterpoint to that. Uh, One, I think people do somewhat overestimate how futile it is to predict the future. And we have an ongoing project on this. So we have a contractor working right now on looking back at a bunch of 10 or 20 or 30 year predictions and scoring them according to whether they came true or false. These predictions that were made decades ago. And so we'll see how that goes. But another thing I'd say is, you know, you can't know the future, but it seems possible that you can be well calibrated about the future. So, you know, if you look at, for example, Slate Star Codex every year is putting up a whole bunch of probabilities about things that that blogger is not an expert on. It doesn't really necessarily know a whole bunch about. So there'll be like a probability that, you know, things improve in the Middle East and, you know, a probability that that someone wins a presidential election. It's like this person doesn't necessarily know what's going to happen. But what they what they do know is they have some sense 
they have some knowledge about their own state of knowledge. They have some knowledge about their own state of ignorance. And so what they're not able to do is accurately predict what's going to happen. What they are able to do is make predictions such that when they say something is 90% likely, they're wrong about 10% of the time. When they say something's 80% likely, they're wrong about 20% of the time. When they say something's 50% likely, they're wrong about half the time. And they know kind of like how likely they are to be wrong, which is different from knowing how, how, what, what's going to happen. And so one of the things that I'd look for in this timelines person is, you know, a deep familiarity with the science of forecasting, which is something that we're very interested in and we've tried to incorporate into our grant making, you know, a deep familiarity with that and an understanding of, you know, what is realistic for them to say 20 years out? Because if someone said, I got it, AI, you know, transformative AI is coming in the year 2031 in February 12th, I would just say, you know, that's ridiculous and I don't care how much you know about the brain because that, that, that's not something someone can know. Um, but if someone hands me a probability distribution and, you know, and I understand that what they're making is partly a statement about their own uncertainty, but their own uncertainty is, is a more thoughtful uncertainty than mine because they've contended with these questions more. That's someone whose opinion I would take pretty seriously and I think that'd be a big step forward compared to anything we have right now. So that was three positions. One, uh, looking at research agendas within AI technical research. Another one, looking at research agendas within uh, policy and international relations and strategy. Uh, And a third one, looking at developing timelines for how likely it is that AI will have particular uh, capabilities at particular different dates. Yep. Uh, Are those jobs going to be advertised uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks or months? I think they'll probably be up when this podcast goes up. Okay, great. So I, think, well, I think they're actually going up tomorrow. Excellent. Okay, yeah. well, I'll, I'll yeah. stick up links to, links to those. Cool. So if, if yeah. you're interested in any of those roles, then, uh, then take a look. Well, the other thing I would add for these roles is I think, you know, we put out these roles because if, if we see someone who's, like, really ready to go in one of these roles, we're going to be very excited and, mm-hmm. and we can hire them for sure. But p- partly we posted the roles, too, to give people a sense of, you know, if you become a generalist at OpenPhil, that's an example of something, you know, if we don't find someone who's kind of ready to take that role on today, it might be that someone who's a generalist, a research analyst at OpenPhil could be ready for that kind of role, you know, maybe in a couple of years. And so that's, that's another, you know, that's another thing is that if these roles sound interesting to you and they sound like something you'd love to do, but you don't feel like you're necessarily like the best qualified per- person for them today, a thing you can definitely do is apply for a generalist research analyst role, which, which I imagine we'll talk about later. And it's, you know, it's, it's just an example of the kind of thing you could, you could end up growing into if you're a good fit for it. So uh, six months ago or a year ago, you joined the board of the machine learning research nonprofit uh, OpenAI, right? That's right. Um, do you feel you've made a useful contribution there uh, since, since, you, since, since you joined? So my, you know, my general feeling is with OpenAI, first let me just talk about what, what, what that grant is, what we're sure. trying to do with it. Yeah. Um, so OpenAI is a, is a nonprofit, essentially AI lab, and it's, it, we've made a bunch of grants to AI safety organizations, to, you know, to Machine Intelligence Research Institute, Future of Humanity Institute. Um, these are organizations dedicated to working on AI safety. OpenAI is something different. OpenAI is you know, both working on AI safety and working on advancing the state of the art in AI research. And I think that, you know, comes with a different profile and it's, you know, significantly more expensive kind of undertaking. And I think it also, you know, there's pros and cons in terms of the ability to contribute to safety. But I think in some ways, an organization like that is in many ways better positioned to do things about certain certain elements of AI safety than safety focused organizations. Um, so for example, you know, one of the things I've said we really want to do is field building. We want there to be, you know, a field of people who do AI safety research And one of the challenges we run into is that we need people to see that there are careers in that field. Mm. And so one of the best things that could happen for AI safety is if it became kind of common belief and common knowledge that there are great career tracks and great jobs available. And some of the most desirable jobs, just generically, are jobs at a lab like OpenAI, like DeepMind, like Google Brain, a lab that is just like right in the heart of the field, right in the cutting edge of capabilities. And so, you know, to me... Groups like OpenAI, DeepMind, and Brain, they have outsized influence on just like how safety is perceived among ML researchers and how likely ML researchers are to see it as a legitimate career, as a place where they can, you know, really have a good career trajectory and do great work and be surrounded by great people. So that's one way in which, you know, a place like OpenAI is kind of in a special position. Also, when you think about the, you know, some of the strategic and geopolitical challenges I mentioned, you know, I do think that if and when uh, you know, or rather, I would say, I should say if, you know, if, if we're in a situation where transformative AI um, looks like it's going to be developed quite soon, I've talked about some of the issues that raises geopolitically and some of the balance of power issues. And, you know, I think it's quite likely that kind of the, the labs that are advancing the state of the art are going to be seen as the experts are going to have, you know, the people who, who are in the highest demand 
to consult, to weigh in on how these situations should be handled. And I think there again, you know, there are certain ways in which in which OpenAI, I think, is in a special position to affect how that kind of thing happens. And I also think they're also, you know, as a lab that works on the state of the art, they, they face considerations that a safety focused organization does not, such as, you know, when to be open. I mean, what when they have research that could advance the state of the field and could be a big public good, but also potentially at some future date, I wouldn't say today, but at some future date, could also, you know, be dangerous in the wrong hands. I mean, what, what kind of research should be shared and shouldn't be? So I think OpenAI is, you know, in general, I think these industry labs are just incredibly important. I think the what they do and what they do for safety just sets the tone for, you know, how all AI researchers and how all people think about safety and what they do about it. And, you know, I think in many cases, industry labs, unlike academic labs, are places where there's not much opportunity for open fill and our funding to make much difference. And open AI is an exception. And we really, you know, we jumped at the opportunity because they're kind of industry conceptually. They're working on the state of the art and they're very heavy on, you know, uh, heavy on like large scale experiments and stuff like that. But they're also nonprofit. And so, you know, we kind of jumped at the opportunity to to uh, become closely involved with them in a way that we felt we might play a role in them putting more of an emphasis on best practices from the perspective of reducing AI risks. And so, you know, what we did is is we made a major grant to OpenAI and, uh, you know, OpenPhil holds a board seat, which is currently filled by me, but that, you know, the seat is held by the organization. And the idea was, you know, and we put this in our grant write-up, which is which is available. The idea is that, um, you know, we we want to have the opportunity to kind of make our case to OpenAI about how to do the best things for reducing AI risks. And then to the extent that OpenAI is doing the best it can, we want to support it because we think that a lab that is setting a good example and doing the right things um, for safety is is a positive impact on the world. And so when I talk about the impact that's had since then, it hasn't been that long, but I want to be clear that what what I what I don't want to do because I don't think it's appropriate is to disentangle sort of, you know, what OpenAI has done from what like I have done as a board member. I mean, as a, as a board member, I'm kind of part of the organization and I don't think it's, you know, it's particularly appropriate to try and talk about, you know, let's say like every internal conversation that's been had. <laughs> um, instead, you know, the questions that we are going to ask at Renewal, which is a couple years off, um, but that we're asking, you know, always in the interim is, is OpenAI on track to become an organization that's, that's you know, really focused on safety and really doing everything it can to maximize, you know, its contribution to improving AI safety? And so, you know, basically, if the answer to that question is yes, we're going to be happy, whether, whether that is, you know, attributable or partly attributable to us or not, we don't care. Um, we think if they're a good influence, we're going to be happy to support them and continue the relationship. If the answer is no, then we're not. And, you know, I, I mean, so therefore, you know, without going into any particular detail, I mean, I, I would I would say that I feel optimistic about this at, at the moment. Um, I think that OpenAI leadership, I think, is really genuinely and, and thoroughly passionately committed to safety, but I also think that they have had, you know, plenty of disagreements with us about exactly what that means, and I think we've had a lot of fruitful conversations, um, but I do feel optimistic that we're going to get to a good place. So, as recently as 2012, uh, you wrote a, a blog post uh, called Thoughts on the Singularity Institute, where you explained why you didn't think that uh, risks from artificial intelligence were as serious as, as some other people in, in the Bay Area were, were, were making out. And I guess now you're, you're one of the most important players uh, in, in, in the entire field. I, I guess the fact that, that you changed your mind uh, makes me somewhat more confident that we've reached the right conclusions, because you, you, you certainly weren't biased in favor of reaching uh, this, this, this view to begin with. H- how do you feel about uh, having basically done a well, it seems like a 180. Uh, is, is that is that how you would uh, perceive it, or do you think it's more of a more of a subtle change of opinion? Uh, I wouldn't describe it as subtle. I don't, I don't know if I'd go all the way to 180. So I think <laughs> you know, uh, if, if you look at the post that I wrote, it was it was pretty focused on a particular organization, hmm. and I think I did I did try to limit my claims in scope. Obviously, I think people took a certain tone from it, um, but I tried to limit my claims to kind of you know the things that are being said about the nature of this risk do not make sense. And so I don't recommend supporting this organization, um, which is different from saying like, there's no AI risks. Um, but you know, that said, I mean, yeah, I've, I've changed my mind. I, I would not call it a subtle change. I, mean, I, I would say I've changed my mind quite a bit. And, and certainly how I see the nature of the alignment problem, you know, I, I tried to spell this out in the post three key ways I've changed my mind. But, you know, I think, I think at that time, it didn't make a ton of sense to me I think it's not that intuitive generally that you could have kind of a an AI that is very powerful and very smart in some ways, but also is pursuing a 
a really destructive goal, and also there's nothing people can do to stop it. And I think there's there's various objections you could make that say, you know, it shouldn't be that hard. It's it's not that it's guaranteed, and you know, I, I basically am a, am a believer and always have been in, in the, what is called the orthogonality thesis that you you could you definitely could build something very smart with terrible values. But there are certain arguments that like maybe it shouldn't be that hard to do it right. You know, maybe it shouldn't be that hard to get a computer to do what you want it to do, roughly speaking. That at the time, I think the arguments kind of, as a complete non-expert, the arguments made sense to me, but that didn't really matter. Um, the kind of the counter arguments, the arguments that this shouldn't be that hard, they made sense to me. But also, I just didn't feel I didn't feel that that the top people in the ML world um, were on the side of Miri um, or were really paying attention to them, and I thought that was a bad sign. And I kind of believed that. You know, I kind of believe that there were there was probably a really good counter argument out there somewhere, even if it wasn't the exact one I had in my mind, and it might be the one I had in my mind for why it was going to be much easier to avoid this kind of alignment problem um, than Miri was saying. And you know, that is something where I, you know, I think it was just wrong. I think that some of the some of the things that I've been talking about, where it's a very different thing. I mentioned it's very different to work on AI all day versus to predict when AI can do what. I think it's also very different to work on AI all day and to think about kind of future potential risks from AI alignment. I think those are different things. And I think that I, you know, I have changed my mind about just how to interpret the lack of dialogue around that and the lack of endorsement there. I don't, I think in some ways there's still a lack of dialogue. So I don't think a ton has necessarily changed, but I've, I've definitely changed my mind how to interpret it. And I've spelled that out a fair amount. And, um, you know, I still, I mean, I look back at that post and I still think some of the specific things Miri was saying that I was criticizing them for, I haven't necessarily come around to their side of those specific debates, but I think, um, you know, I think on the general issue, I think they were, they were really early pointing to what is now being called the alignment problem. And I think that's, you know, one of the most important problems to be thinking about in the world today. And, and they get a lot of credit for being early to it. And, and I definitely changed my mind on that. So this leads into the, the next topic I was going to bring up, which is, you know, OpenField doesn't have the resources to look into, uh, you know, every every debate that comes up that's relevant to, to the grants that you're making or the problems that you might work on. So to some extent, you have to rely on expert judgment uh, because you just can't can't reinvent the wheel every time. But at the same time, sometimes you probably have to deviate from expert judgment. Otherwise, the things you do are going to be very boring and you're just going to be working in areas that are very crowded because you're just following in the consensus. How do you thread that needle of deciding you know, when to trust the experts and, and, and when not to and when to kind of make a contrarian bet? Sure. Yeah. So the the question of you know the question of how to weigh expert consensus and in, in all the all the rest of the considerations is definitely one that we struggle with. I mean, I, I think in general, you know, OpenField wants to be set up to do unconventional, risky things that go against consensus. Um, you know, a lot of the biggest hits I think are going to be when you know when maybe a small set of experts who are looking at something in an unusual way have an insight. And a lot of times, just because of the way the world is, a lot of people will be resistant to that, and it won't necessarily go over that well. And it might be, you know, several decades that, that people actually decide the original contrarians are right. And we want to be able to make bets like that. And so, you know, that is how we've kind of tried to set ourselves up. As far as Open Phil's philosophy goes, the right time to be contrarian is when when you're sort of the expert who is making the most sense to you is a contrarian. And so I think a, you know, a bad time to be contrarian is when all the experts say X and it seems to you like not X, but all the experts are saying X and you don't know. And it's like every single one of them knows more than you do. And you, you don't know anyone who like, who knows all the things they do and agrees with you. That, that's like a bad time to be contrarian. Mm. And, and, you know, I mean, I think that was, I think with, with a, with an incorrect interpretation of who is an expert and what, that was kind of one of the heuristics I was using when I wrote the critical things about uh, Miri, then called the Singularity Institute, is that's, that's what I was seeing, is I just, did, you know, I didn't see any kind of intersection in the Venn diagram between deep familiarity with AI systems and, like, endorsing the kind of, you know, issues that were being raised. But, you know, the thing that OpenPhil tries to do is we try to, I mean, A, a, a ton of what I do personally in my job is I consider my main job to be hiring and managing and it's it's all about deciding whom to trust and for what and what you know what everyone's area of expertise is and and what they're good at because I certainly don't have time to understand everything myself and you know I basically don't understand anything these days as well as I'd like to or even close <laughs> so you know I see my job as like my goal and the, and the thing that I try to optimize for is I want to you know hire people who are just obsessed with their fields really sharp and are as deep in their field and as knowledgeable about it as it's reasonable to be. And then they're familiar with all the people who are experts on subtopics within their fields. And then when someone who is as well positioned to understand the situation as anyone else in the universe is making a contrarian point and their contrarian point is making sense to us and it seems really important and we have a decent story about why their point might be rejected, even if true, Mm -hmm. um, then I think that's a time when we're happy to take a contrarian bet. 
Do you worry that it's uh, too easy to come up with stories explaining why people are rejecting views? Because you can just say, oh, well, you know, people are conservative. They don't like to change their view. They went into the existing thing because they've already endorsed it. Yep. I, mean, I mean, yeah, people with, with odd views always have some story about how they're persecuted and everyone else is uh, yeah. uh, laboring under an illusion. Yeah, I, I definitely. I mean, I think if, if, all, if the only way you're checking your views is you're like, do I have a story about what the other side is doing wrong? I think it's just like never enough. And I think that's a, a really dangerous way to reason. So, I, you know, I think of it as like, just one little piece. Um, I do, you know, I generally favor trying to build also a pretty sophisticated and somewhat specific model of, you know, what the world's current institutions are set up to do well and what they're not set up to do well. Because if you don't have a pretty detailed model, you can kind of always look at anything and just be like, well, you know, institutions are, institutions are messed up. So of course this very important thing isn't happening. And in fact, you know, a lot of important things in the world do happen. And a lot of, a lot of causes that are important in kind of wonky and difficult to follow in counterintuitive ways still get a lot of attention because there are a lot of institutions in the world that are meant to be intellectual, analytical, rigorous, and, you know, and work on things that may be counterintuitive, but that are important. And so I think having, you know, having some kind of model is, is one of the things that I, you know, that I try to informally and, and not as formally as I'd like to, but I try to informally have a sense of, you know, when I hear a new grant idea, I say, what institution does it seem like this would most likely fit into? Is this something an academic could do? Is this something a scientist could do? Is this something a think tank could do? Is this something a government could do? And why aren't they doing it? And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to refine my ideas of what the different institutions do tend to do and what they don't. So what things do you think you've learned over the last 11 years of doing this kind of research about uh, you know, in what situations you can trust expert consensus and in what cases you should think there's a substantial chance that it's quite mistaken? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, I think it's it's hard to generalize about this. And sometimes I wish I would, like, write in my model more explicitly. I thought it was cool that, um, that Elias Ryutkowski did that in, in his book, Inadequate Equilibria. You know, I think I think one thing that I especially look for at, in terms of when we're doing philanthropy is I, I'm especially interested in the role of academia and what academia is able to do because... You can look at corporations, you can understand their incentives. You can look at governments, you can sort of understand their incentives. You can look at think tanks, and a lot of them are just like, they're aimed directly at governments in a sense, and so you can sort of understand what's going on there. But academia is kind of the default home for people who, you know, really spend all their time thinking about things that are intellectual, that could be important to the world, um, but that there's no direct, you know, there's no client who's like, I need this now for this reason, and I'm, and I'm making you do it. So a lot of the times, you know, when someone when someone says someone should let's say work on AI alignment or work on AI strategy or you know or for example like evaluate the evidence base for bed nets and deworming which is what Givewell does a lot of my a lot of the time my first question when it's not obvious where else it fits is would this fit into academia and is this and this is something where where my opinions and my views have evolved a lot where I used to have this very simplified you know academia that's like this giant set of universities there's a whole ton of very smart intellectuals who knows they can do everything there's a zillion fields there's kind of you you know, a literature on everything as, you know, has been written on marginal revolution, all that sort of thing. And so I would really never know when to expect that something was going to be neglected when it wasn't. And it takes a giant literature review to figure out which is which. And I would say I've, I've definitely evolved on that where I, you know, I sort of today when I think about what academia does, I think it is really set up to push the frontier of knowledge. You know, the vast majority, and I think especially in the, in the harder sciences, I would say the vast majority of what is going on in academia is people are trying to do something novel, interesting, clever, creative, different, new, provocative, that really pushes the boundaries of knowledge forward in a new way. And that's a really important, obviously, and great thing. I'm really incredibly glad we have institutions to do it. But I think there are a whole bunch of other activities that are intellectual, that are challenging, that take a lot of intellectual work, and that are incredibly important, and that are not that. And they have nowhere else to live. No one else can do them. And so I'm especially interested, and my eyes especially kind of light up when I see an opportunity to, you know, there's an intellectual topic. It's really important to the world, but it's not advancing the frontier of knowledge. It's more figuring out something in a pragmatic way that is, you know, going to inform what decision makers should do. And also there's no one decision maker asking for it, you know, as would be the case with government or, or corporations. So, you know, to give examples of this, I mean, I think GiveWell is kind of the first place where, you know, I might have initially expected that there was going to be development economics was going to tell us what the best charities are. Or at least tell us what the best interventions are. Like, tell us, you know, is bed nets, deworming, cash transfers, agricultural extension programs, education improvement programs, which ones are helping the most people for the, for the least money? And there's really very little work on this in academia. Um, a lot of times there'll be one study that tries to estimate the impact of deworming, but 
very few or no attempts to really replicate it because it's much more valuable to academics to have a new insight, to show something new about the world than to kind of try and nail something down. And it really, you know, it really got brought home to me uh, recently when, you know, we were doing our criminal justice reform work and we wanted to check ourselves. We wanted to check this basic assumption that, you know, that it would be good to have less incarceration in the U.S. And so uh, David Rudman, who, you know, is basically the, the person that I consider sort of the gold standard of a, of a critical evidence reviewer, someone who can really dig on a complicated literature and come up with the answers, he did what I think was a really wonderful and really fascinating paper, which is up on our website, where he looked for all the studies on the relationship between incarceration and crime. And, you know, what happens if you cut incarceration? Do you expect crime to rise, to fall, to stay the same? And he really, he picked them apart. And what happened is he found a lot of the best, most prestigious studies. And about half of them, he found like fatal flaws in when he just tried to, you know, replicate them or or redo their conclusions. And so when he put it all together, he ended up with a different conclusion from what you would get if you just read the abstracts. And it was a completely novel piece of work that kind of reviewed this whole evidence base at a level of thoroughness that had never been done before, came out with a conclusion that was different from what you naively would have thought, which, you know, kind of concluded his best estimate is that at current margins, we could cut incarceration and there'd be no expected impact on crime. And he did all that. And then he started submitting it to journals. And, you know, he's gotten rejected from like a large number of journals by now. I mean, I think we're kind of starting with the most prestigious ones. and then going to Why the less. Well, because because his paper, it's it's really I think it's incredibly well done. It's incredibly important, but there's nothing in some sense, in some kind of academic taste sense, there's nothing new in there. Like he took a bunch of studies, he kind of redid them. He found that they broke. You know, he found that like he found new issues with them, and and he found new conclusions. And from a policymaker or philanthropist perspective, all very interesting stuff. But did we really find a new method for asserting causality? Did we really find a new insight about how the mind of a you know how the mind of a of a of of a you know a perpetrator works? No, we didn't. We didn't learn it. We didn't advance the frontiers of knowledge. We pulled together a bunch of knowledge that we already had, and we synthesized it. And I think that's a common you know that's a common theme is that I think. Our academic institutions were set up a while ago, and they were set up in a time when it seemed like the most valuable thing to do was just to search for the next big insight. And these days, we've, they've been around for a while. We've, we've got a lot of insights. We've got a lot of insights sitting around. We've got a lot of studies. And what I think a lot of the times what we need to do is take the information that's already available, take the studies that already exist, and synthesize them critically and say, what does this mean for what we should do, where we should give money, what policy should be, and... You know, I don't think that um, I don't think there's any home in academia to do that. And I think that creates a lot of the gaps. So this also applies to AI timelines where it's like, you know, there's nothing particularly innovative, groundbreaking, knowledge frontier, advancing, creative, clever about just it's a question that matters. It's when, you know, when can we expect transformative AI and with what probability it matters. But it's, it's not a work of frontier advancing intellectual creativity to try to answer it. And so a very common theme in a lot of the work we advance is, you know, instead of pushing the frontiers of knowledge, take knowledge that's already out there, pull it together, critique it, synthesize it, and decide what that means for what we should do. And especially, I think there's there's also very little in the way of institutions that are trying to anticipate big intellectual breakthroughs down the road, such as AI, such as other technologies that could change the world, and think about how they could make the world better or worse and what we can do to prepare for them. And I think, you know, historically, when academia was set up, we were kind of in a world where it was, it was really hard to predict what the next scientific breakthrough was going to be, and it was really going to, hard to predict how it would affect the world, but it usually turned out pretty well. And I think for various reasons, the scientific landscape may be changing now, where it's, I think in some ways there are arguments it's getting easier to see where things are headed. We know more about science. We know more about the ground rules. We know more about what cannot be done, and we know more about what probably eventually can be done. And I think it's, it's somewhat of a happy coincidence so far that most breakthroughs have been good. And so to say, I see a breakthrough on the horizon. Is that good or bad? How can we prepare for it? That's another thing academia is really not set up to do. Academia is set up to get the breakthrough. And so, you know, that, that is a question I ask myself a lot is, here's, here's an intellectual activity. Why can't it be done in academia? But these days, my answer is, you know, if it's, if it's really primarily of interest to a very cosmopolitan philanthropist trying to help the whole future, um, and there's no one client, and it's not frontier advancing, then, then I think that that does make it pretty plausible to me that there's no one doing it. And, and we would love to, you know, change that at least somewhat by funding what we think is the most important work. Something that doesn't quite fit with that is that you do see a lot of kind of practical psychology and nutrition papers that are trying to answer, you know, questions that the public have, usually done very poorly, and, and you can't really trust the answers. Yeah. But it's things like, you know, does chocolate prevent cancer or 
some some nonsense a small sample paper like that sure. that seems kind of like it's not it's not pushing forward methodology it's just doing an application uh, how, how does that fit into this model well i mean first off it's a generalization so i'm not, not going to say it's everything but I, I will also say that stuff is very low prestige mm. um and i think it, it tends so first off i mean a that that work you know it's it's not the hot thing to work on mm. um and for that reason i think correlated with that you see a lot of just like work that isn't it's not very well funded. It's not very well executed. It's not very well done. It doesn't tell you very much. Like the vast majority of nutrition studies out there are just, you know, you can look at even even a sample report we did on carbs and obesity that Luke Muehlhauser did. It just, you know, these studies are, are just, if someone had, had gone after them a little harder with, with the kind of the energy and the funding that we go after some of the fundamental stuff, they could have been a lot more informative. And then the other thing is that, you know, you will a thing you will see even less of is good critical evidence review. Mm. So you'll you'll see a study. So you're right. You'll see a study that's you know does chocolate lead to more disease or whatever. And and sometimes that study will use established methods and it's just another data point. But the part about you know the part about taking what's out there and synthesizing it all and saying there's a thousand studies. Here are the ones that are worth looking at. Here are their strengths. Here are their weaknesses. There are literature reviews, but I. I um, don't think they're a very prestigious thing to do, and I don't think they're done super great. And so I think, for example, you know, I think I think some of the stuff, for example, GiveWell does, it's like they have to reinvent a lot of this stuff, and they have to do a lot of the critical evidence reviews because they're not already out there. Hmm. And same with David. Okay, let's move on to talking about some of the job opportunities that are coming up at, at OpenPhil over the next uh, few weeks. Yep. Um, I saw that you just put on your website uh, vacancies for a whole lot of general research analysts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tell, tell us a bit about that. It seems like you're hiring quite a lot more people than, than you normally do at, at any one point in time. Yeah, so we're going on a big hiring push. And, um, you know, I mean, basically the story is we, we have a couple, we have like basically uh, a few research analysts now that all, m- well, not all, but in most mostly started as GiveWell interns or people who worked at GiveWell when we were still more closely integrated with GiveWell. And the thing we've never done as open philanthropy is really like hire in research analysts and intensively sort of mentor them and train them the way that GiveWell does. And for a while, that was because we didn't feel we had the mentorship and management capacity and we were more focused on other things. We were trying to get our grant making up to a, you know, to a high level, um, which it's at, you know, now, I mean, it's going to grow more in the future, but it's at a high level. And we were trying to do a whole bunch of other stuff. And I, I think, it, you know, late last year, a bunch of us were looking at the situation and we said, A, you know, People who have been research analysts are just creating huge amounts of value for open fill. And a lot of them are, are some of them, I mean, not a lot, there's only a few total, but some of them are becoming specialists in a sense, that they've been generalists, they've been doing analyses, but now, you know, we've got one who's focused more on AI strategy, we've got one who's focused more on biosecurity for the time being. These are people who could end up filling some of the roles, you know, specialized roles, like looking at particular aspects of particular problems that are hardest to fill from hiring from outside. And then as those people specialize, we don't have shrinking generals needs, we have growing generals needs because we've got this giant daunting project of how much money goes into each cause, which we talked about, and how do we prioritize between different causes, and we think there's going to be just a ton of work to do there, some of it philosophical, like, you know, these questions of how to think about long-termism and how to weigh it, most of it, I would say, empirical, Um, just trying to imagine, you know, what would it look like to put money behind different worldviews, what causes would that put us in, what would be the cost-effectiveness of them, what would be the downsides and upsides of being in those causes, I think there's a lot of empirical work to do there, plus as our portfolio matures, we're going to want to do more work looking back and evaluating our own impact. And so there's going to be a ton of work to do there. So we said, you know, we have a ton of work to do. We have fewer people in this role doing it than we used to because some of them are now specializing in just like needs we especially have and high priority causes. These people can do a huge amount of good. And we, we're a little bit more a tr- mature organization and we're a little bit more ready to take on the challenge of bringing a whole bunch of people to intensively train and mentor them and try to get them to the point where they can contribute greatly as research analysts. So we decided to go on this big push and, you know, we're hoping to hire a bunch. And I'm just, I'm really, really excited about this search because the research analyst of today um, is the core contributor of, of in the future. And, you know, there's a lot of roles at OpenPhil that just, they take so much OpenPhil context. A lot of them are on special causes or, or, or kind of subtopics that we have an especially distinctive take on. So you have to be like really familiar with the way we think, really familiar with OpenPhil, familiar with our ways of communicating, familiar with our ways of being productive. And then also our, our managerial roles, I think. And then... You know, it's roles like that where it's it's only because we hired a research analyst two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, that we have someone today who's able to take on this incredibly high leverage core contributor role. You know, and, and, and so that's I'm excited about this search because I think we have we have an opportunity to really invest heavily in the long term future of open fill and hire people who, you know, I think they're going to have 
interesting jobs and stuff to contribute, but they're also going to be the people who are, who are positioned to become leaders of the org um, in the long run and, and positioned to do a lot of other things too, because I think that we, you know, I think that we do train people in some generalizable skills such as, you know, rigorously and critically evaluating things, writing up your reasoning so that others can follow it and so that it's calibrated and working with like maximal productivity and thoroughness trade-off. So how many do you think you might hire up front and, and do you expect to, to keep everyone? It seemed like you, you might just double the size of the organization basically overnight. I don't think we're going to double the size of the organization overnight. So I think we're, you know, we're about 20 people now. When I look at our longer term, you know, our medium term management capacity, my best guess is we'll probably end up with like three to six research analysts who are here full time, long term. We'll see. I mean, if there's, you know, more outstanding candidates or fewer, we can always change that number. So, yeah, how much good do you think uh, someone can do in this role? Like, how much money are we thinking of moving and, uh, you know, on the margin of the grant opportunity is really strong? Sure. I mean, it's very hard to generalize and very hard to do anything like quantifying, you know, because careers are very dynamic and because I think, you know, many of the most successful careers just take so so many unexpected twists and turns, you know, to estimate this, the good someone's going to do in their career. I mean, I often, I often encourage people instead to, you know, to put a lot of weight to, to kind of look at all the things that, that look like they're within the margin of error on being high impact and then put a lot of weight on what it seems like they would be really great at and, and you know, excited to do and just like able to stick with for a long enough time to become world class at. So I don't want to make too, too precise statements, but, you know, I can say that OpenFill, I think, A, it's a special organization, especially for people who are interested in effective altruism. I don't think there's any funder of remotely comparable size or any advisor to comparably sized funders that, you know, has this value of doing the most good possible in this very analytical, determined way um, that we do. And so if you're passionate about effective altruism or you're passionate about some of the specific causes, like the long-termist causes, like the farm animal welfare, like, you know, and and including potential risk for advanced AI, I think this is one of the places where you can have the most impact. It's it's hard for me to come up with anything that, that, that clearly beats it. And, you know, I mean, look at the situation. I mean, there's currently about 20 people on staff and we're giving between 100 and 200 million dollars a year staff is going to grow giving is going to grow but you know the overall feeling is there's there's a lot uh going on per person and there's there's a lot of opportunities and i also think this is you know this is a role and this is an organization where we really believe in investing in people and getting them to the point where they're able to do exciting things with a lot of autonomy and that is you know the track that a lot of our current research analysts have taken so yeah i think this is an opportunity to to really have a lot of leverage to influence a lot of resources and to build a lot of skills, which I think in some ways is, you know, is just as important or more important. So I guess doing all of this training with new stuff now could potentially delay grants a bit, but you think over you know, the three to five year time scale, it's going to pay off well because you have new managers and uh, you know, really good research analysts and otherwise you'd be bottlenecked later on. That's right. I mean, it delays something. I mean, I, I don't actually expect our grant flow to go down because we, you know, the, the current way the organization is, is there's, it's mostly program officers making the grants. And then a lot of the generalists are more working on things like cause selection and prioritization. So mm-hmm. something will slow down, right? We'll, we'll have to trade something to do all this investment in mentorship and man- management. But I definitely think it'll pay off. And I, I think we can spare it today, um, just taking the long view. So Open Phil has a somewhat distinctive culture. What kind of people do you find thrive in that and what kind of people, you know, don't enjoy it and, and end up leaving after a while? Sure. So, um, you know, I, w- I would describe Open Phil's culture as uh, focused first and foremost on truth seeking. You know, I think we, we definitely, you know, we want uh, an environment where everyone is able to be comfortable and uh, be supported in their work and all that. But, you know, sometimes disagreement is uncomfortable. And in the end, if we have to choose, uh, we're always going to do the thing that gets us closer to finding the best answer and doing the best thing. And so, you know, there's definitely a lot at Open Phil. There's, there's a lot of uh, the phenomenon of people kind of having critical discussions with each other where, you know, you might say something and someone else will say why they disagree with you. And one of the major values that we really try to inculcate at Open Phil is people thinking for themselves, speaking up when they don't agree with something. And that includes pushing back on their manager, which is, you know, a bit of a distinctive, you know, a bit of an unusual thing to see in an organization and a bit of a hard thing for us to promote and something that we don't always do as well as I'd like. But in general, you know, my model is when I'm managing someone, I'm asking them to do things and they see a lot that I don't see as they're doing those things. And they are able to, you know, they're going to have a lot of insights that I don't have. They're going to be right about a lot of things where I'm wrong. And in a lot of organizations, there's this kind of mentality that you should go along to get along. You shouldn't mess with your alliances. If someone tells you to do something, you should just do what they said. You shouldn't argue with them. And we really try and, you know, get people out of that mindset. We, we think, you know, disagreement is good. Feedback is good. You know, pushing back on your manager is good. It leads to better results. And we try and create an environment where people can really, you know, focus on getting to the truth 
and treat, you know, treat criticism as an opportunity to improve and, um, and have this kind of constant hunger to be better at everything. So that, that's a distinctive thing about the culture. You know, some other distinctive things about it, I think we're, we're very into just like calibration and transparency of reasoning. So a general pattern at OpenFill is that, um, you know, we, we, we really like it when someone makes a suggestion or a recommendation. It's really great if they also at the same time say the best reason not to take the recommendation. Um, that's especially something with grants where we're very upfront about it. We say, you know, the grant write-up needs to include a section on why it would be good not to make this grant and what the best counter argument would be. And I think we, we do train this, so we don't expect people to be, you know, necessarily amazing at it coming in. But this is an organization where we all try and be kind of clear with each other at all times. This is why I think this. This is what my reasons are. This is how confident I am. This is what reservations I have. And so, you know, again, it's, it's all in that service of truth-seeking. And uh, the final thing that I, that I would say, you know, is somewhat, somewhat noticeable about the open fill culture is this kind of, you know, pro-change, pro-improvement all the time mindset. And I think obviously it sounds nice when I say it that way, but it can be quite disorienting that, you know, we don't necessarily put value on stability or predictability in and of itself or or put much value on it. I mean, we think it has value, but there are going to be times everyone here has been through the process of like putting a ton of work into something and then at some point just realizing, you know what, this isn't that valuable or drop it. Um, and we're not going to do anything with it. We're not going to finish it. We're not going to publish it. That happens. And I think, you know, this is, this is a place where we just, we're always trying to get to the best thing, not get held back by sunk costs or by any kind of corporate politics or by any kind of, you know, agreeableness heuristic. And I think for some people, you know, that's disorienting and it can feel like kind of a, you know, it's, it's not the best for everyone, but I think for people who really are incredibly passionate about getting to the truth and doing the most good and whatever it takes to get there, I think this is a, this is a really great place to be in a pretty special place. Uh, how much does it pay? I mean, it's, it's not that cheap living in San Francisco. It's notoriously quite pricey. Sure. I mean, pay pay is a function, you know, we consider both someone's role and their relevant experience. So there's not a general answer to that. And I'm not going to name salaries. We don't do that on the web. I'm not going to do it in the, in the podcast. You know, in general, our philosophy is that we try to make pay in, in some sense a non-issue in that, um, you know, we, we try to pay such that people who are passionate about our work are never going to have to turn us down for money reasons. Um, they're going to be able to, you know, live at a good standard of living and, and it's going to be competitive with, for example, other nonprofit jobs they might take. On the other hand, we don't want to pay people the way that hedge funds pay people. We don't want people coming here for the money because because a lot of one of the main qualifications for being great at open fill is truly buying into the mission, truly understanding it, truly having a passion for it. And we don't want this to be the place where people come and people stay just because they want a paycheck. That would put a burden on our evaluation process that I frankly don't think we'd be that well equipped to handle. So, you know, I, I would say that this is this is not a job. You, you shouldn't take this job if your main priority in life is money. Everyone here could, could make more if they went somewhere else uh, for profit. But uh, I also don't think money is going to be a reason not to take it if you're excited about the work. Maybe could you describe a bit what the work is actually like on a, on a day-to-day basis? Yep. Well, it obviously varies by the role, but some of the main things that I anticipate some of the new hires doing is they come in. And I'll focus on the research analyst because it's kind of the most the, the, the generalist one for now. You know, I think uh, there's cause prioritization. So, and then there's uh, related to cause prioritization, there's kind of literature reviews. So this would be kind of, you know, we want to know, uh, let's say, how good cage-free systems are for chickens as opposed to battery cage systems, which is something we put out a write-up on. Or we want to know how much money we could spend on a certain cause and how how cost-effective that would be, how much good we would expect it to do per dollar. And these are matters of just empirical investigation, finding the literature, finding the best papers, being critical, finding the weaknesses in the papers, finding the reservations, and then creating a, you know, a write-up where everyone can see what conclusion you're reaching, why, and what the major weaknesses in it are. Another, you know, core function of open philanthropy people is grant investigation. So that would be, you know, there's a grant we're thinking about making. You talk to the organization, you ask them, you know, the questions that we need to ask them, and you try and write up the case for and against the grant. So, you know, a lot of it, it's, it tends to be pretty analytical work. It tends to be desk work. I, I think one of the weaknesses of this job, it's, it doesn't always, isn't always the most satisfying from the perspective of having like a lot of camaraderie because we do a lot of different projects that are all kind of independent of each other because we're kind of money heavy and, you know, have a lot of money per per um, time in, in some sense. And so we're, we're often trying to have like not too many people working on exactly on one given thing. So I think that can be a downside, although I think possibly the new research analysts, especially if a lot of them are working on cause prioritization, may have more interaction and collaboration and, and discussion. But there's, yeah, generally a lot of work where we're, we're trying to reach a conclusion, we're trying to do it in a very analytical, thorough way where you're balancing, you know, you're balancing efficiency and thoroughness and you're coming out with a product that people can understand why you're saying what you're saying. 
it, it could be a great intellectual development uh, process for people who, who want to be able to do that kind of thing. I think we have experience with it and are ready to train people for it, and obviously not for everyone. What kind of career capital are people building and what kind of p- career progression is there, b- both if they stay with Open Fill and if they potentially leave after a couple of years? Sure. So in terms of career capital, I mean, I think right off the bat, I mean, we're just we're going to be investing in people. And I think we're going to be, you know, some of the main skills we're going to be teaching are how to critically assess evidence, how to find the weaknesses in it, how to reach a conclusion when there's a lot of confusing information and a lot of people trying to sell different conclusions in different ways, how to cut to the bottom of it. So you're not just reading abstracts, you're not just listening to what experts think, but you're looking at, you know, what their evidence is and and how they're coming to that conclusion. And maybe you're also using a bit of best practices from the science of forecasting. Um, So I think people are going to be learning to do that. They're going to be learning to communicate in an efficient and like thorough calibrated way. They're going to be learning to gather information efficiently and to get projects done. And so I think, you know, right, right there, those are really good general skills that I think for a lot of the things that need to be done and for a lot of things that effective altruists want to do are really useful. And then, you know, over time, I think there's all kinds of ways people can grow. So we really try here to always have everyone doing, you know, things that stretch them, things that challenge them. Lots of people have have moved up quite rapidly and quite dramatically here over the long run. You know, the upside within the organization is is pretty unlimited. I mean, you know, you could you could end up uh, running the place. It's it's just a matter of you know what you end up being good at and and what fits you. Certainly, some of the longer term roles you could end up as a program officer or a grant investigator. So some cause or some sub cause that we are having trouble hiring for from the outside, or that we think is just especially important, or or something else, or you're a really good fit for it you know, you might end up being kind of in the program officer role where you're responsible for tens of millions of dollars a year or maybe more of grant making to accomplish some objective. And you're really the point person on that. And you're really running that show, definitely subject to oversight at the 50, 40, 10 rule that I described. It could lead to other things too. So, you know, I mentioned the AI roles, spending your life on timelines and when AI can do what, spending your life on AI strategy and handling the geopolitics, spending your life on AI technical agendas and what the most promising ones are. I think those all have strong elements of this kind of open fill research analyst role. I mean, you know, being able to sort through a lot of claims and a lot of confusing information, make sense of it all, and then write down your reasons and have those reasons be vetted and do it all efficiently. You know, that's what you need to do. And I think those are some of the most important roles out there. We're trying to hire for them, but I could also imagine people specializing in AI strategy at other places, um, think tanks, FHI. I can imagine people specializing in AI timelines and AI technical agenda evaluation other places. So there's all kinds of places this could lead. And, you know, I think it's I think it's a great place to come to to just develop a bunch of skills and be part of a very high impact organization. For these roles, are you expected to hire recent graduates or people who've already been in the workforce for a couple of years? Uh, really both. So we're you know, we don't have a really strong take on, on what career stage is appropriate here. We're going to see who applies. I, I would basically encourage anyone if this sounds exciting, you should apply. So the, that's the uh, generalist uh, research um, analyst. But uh, so there are a couple of other uh, roles you're hiring for, which is a grants associate, uh, an operations associate, and a, and a general counsel. Do you just want to describe those ones as well? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, that's that's another thing is as we're, you know, positioning ourselves to at some point in the future, uh, give more. I think we need to have, you know, we I think we've had a lot of improvement on operations recently, which I'm, which I'm very excited about. We need to keep that improvement going. And so, you know, the general counsel uh, would be, you know, that, that would be an attorney and, and that would be someone who's trying to basically help us just more efficiently uh, get grants out the door by catching all the all the legal issues with them before we do it. And, you know, with this and, and with some of the other roles, I mean, speed is impact. And so, you know, a while ago, we made a grant to try and cause gene drives, a technology that might eradicate malaria, to try and get it to be developed faster. Um, we put in, you know, something like $20 million to try and speed up the day when malaria would be eradicated. And, you know, Every day we speed up the eradication of malaria. Like I think it's something like a something like a thousand lives um, per day, a thousand untimely deaths averted per day. If we can speed up that eradication, and you know this grant for gene drives took months um, because because there was uh, you know a, a lot of kind of complications with universities and with uh, you know with with various issues. And so speed is impact, and um, you know a general counsel can help us speed things up, and then grants. Management associates can help us speed things up and, and also just, you know, give our grantees a better experience and empower them more. And so, you know, one of the things we want to be is we want to be an organization that not only makes great grant decisions, but is a great partner. And when we support someone, we're making life easy for them. We're getting them the money quickly. We're getting them the money in a way that works for them. And then they're able to go out and do great things. And so those are just examples of what, you know, we're trying to strengthen and, and make our operations much more robust. And we're, you know, also one of the ones you didn't mention, but we're looking also for a director of operations. So it's it's kind of an organization-wide push that we, we want to be able to do more things operationally, want to be able to make, you know, faster, more supportive grants. We want to do a better job 
kind of constantly assessing ourselves and uh, understanding what the grantee experience of us is. And there's a whole bunch of other needs that we have that, you know, that I won't go into here, but that could speed our impact as an organization. Cool. So I, I guess we're, we're kind of done uh, describing the, the, the vacancies that you've got uh, right now. Do you want to you know, give, give a final push to encourage anyone who's listening to you know, actually fill out the form and, and apply for the job rather yeah. than just uh, listen to this and then uh, never think about it again? Well, yeah, yeah you should all apply. Um, <laughs> definitely. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think Open Philanthropy is, is one of the most exciting organizations out there. Just the, the amount that we're able to give and then the way we're, which we're able to give it, just very unconstrained by anything except doing the most good. And if that excites you, I mean, I'm just telling you, we have, we have big needs all of these roles can make a big difference to the organization as well as being just like a source for personal development. So if you're excited about this organization and you're even curious about whether you might be a fit, I mean, yeah, definitely apply. And um, I, I definitely consider this, you know, one of the one of the highest impact things I can certainly think of for, for someone to do. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this job search goes well because I think this is the future of open philanthropy. All right. So um, as a final topic, I, uh, I heard a couple of months ago that you went to an academic conference about about you about utopias. Is that, is that mm-hmm. right? Was, was this for work or just just more for fun? This was for fun. Um, this was just to try something different. So um, I, you know, I, I've just been kind of idly curious about about whether there's much good writing out there on just, you know, the, the topic of utopia and um you know, I, I generally, I, I know I'm familiar with some of the literature, and it's kind of an interesting topic to me because um, because it's it's very hard to describe a utopia that sounds appealing. Um, and, I, you know, I think it somewhat, somewhat relates to some of the, you know, discussions about long-termism when you think about, you know, how good could the future be? Sometimes the conversation gets kind of awkward because you're like, well, the future could be so good, but then as soon as you start to, like, really concretely visualize, it's, like, hard to visualize a very specific world that won't like bother, at least bother a lot of people that you're talking to, or people have objections to it. And in fact, I have the impression people used to write more utopias and now they write more dystopias. And so I've just been kind of curious about this and I was, I was Googling around and trying to think, you know, does anyone write about this topic and why it's difficult? And the only thing I was able to find was this, um, this Society for Utopian Studies that was having its annual conference. So I really wanted to go there and check it out and to go had to submit a paper. So I, um, what I did was I, I kind of took a bunch of classic literary utopias and I ran them through basically mechanical Turk surveys using uh, using some of Spencer Greenberg's technologies to you know to ask people on the internet just here's the utopia how does it sound does it sound good does it sound bad and you know this this to my knowledge is is the first time that someone has kind of tried to empirically analyze how people feel about different descriptions of kind of a of an ideal world kind of knowing going in that none of them were going to do that great and really none of them did and I'm curious about why that is and, and find it interesting and so you know I put this together and then I went to the conference and. You know, I, I thought the whole thing was a very interesting experience. I mean, it turns out that the the conference was mostly focused on literary criticism, uh, <laughs> using utopian lens on literature, which wasn't totally obvious to me before I showed up. And I think somewhat, you know, it further kind of drives home that there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest today in people spelling out what a really good future would look like, what a really good future would look like in the long run. And I think it's just interesting. I, I, I don't know if there's if it's always been this way, but it seems like a not a very lively topic these days, and it just makes me kind of curious. Did the uh, academics at this conference find your presence somewhat amusing, given that you don't know anything particular about literature? I don't imagine you're not an academic and you were bringing them a survey from the internet about utopias? Yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I think some of them thought, boy, this is really different. This is really yeah. interesting. And some of them were like, what are you, what are what you, are doing, you doing here? here? Yeah, so, yeah, that, that kind of happened for sure. So yeah. uh, you said none of the utopias performed particularly well. Uh, what, were the, what were the general trends? Were there, were there, any, yeah. were there any utopias that people uh, disliked less than others? Yeah, it, I was actually pretty surprised by how it all went down because um, first off, I did some some analysis on the survey takers to see their political affiliations, and they, they were very heavily skewed to the left. And so, you know, it was I think Hillary Clinton would have won an election with with this population by you know fifty or sixty points or something like that. And so, you know, I, I tried to write different utopias that would appeal to different political orientations. I kind of had this theory it might break down that way. So I wrote, you know, one that was kind of trying to sound very libertarian and was like all about freedom and anyone can buy anything, sell anything, do anything. And then I wrote another one that was about how this kind of very wise and just government kind of tries to take care of everyone um, and ask people to rate that. And then, you know, I had I had some kind of things that were that were supposed to appeal to conservatives as well. And then it just turned out that the freedom ones just just did the best. They and the government ones just did the worst. Um, mm. Even with this very left leaning population, and I think that I think that's somewhat. I, I wasn't really didn't really understand why that had happened. It could have been a function of the way I wrote it, although I don't really think it was that. But I think I kind of got a better inkling of it at the conference when I was just you know talking to people about their opinions. And I think there's there's kind of a feeling that a lot of people have that 
any world that is described too specifically feels totalitarian. Mm-hmm. And I think that's like that's like why I think a lot of times it's so hard to describe a good future world is that when you say, well, this is what people do all day, people say, well, what if I want to do something else? Mm-hmm. Um, and so really emphasizing that theme of freedom seemed to do well. And that's that's kind of what I, you know, it's something that I'm interested in because I actually think that, um, I think it is worth talking about what we would like a future world to look like. I think we could have a lot of really fruitful debates that look a little bit more long term and that think a little bigger than like debates about exactly what the marginal tax rate should be today. But it is challenging to have those debates when like just the mere act of describing something makes it sound kind of top down and centralized. And then you can you can describe utopia in more abstract terms. You're like, well, what if we just have all the resources we want and we do whatever we want? But then that's not very emotionally compelling. and People don't really know how to picture it and don't know what you're talking about. So um, it's just kind of an interesting challenge to find a way to have kind of coherent conversations about our vision for the world that don't sound kind of like totalitarian and over controlling. And, and that was something, yeah, I did. I did learn some of that from the survey. Also, I mean, this is less surprising, but, you know, none of the none of the utopias from literature or the ones I made up, none of them scored all that well. But I had a different section of the survey that just asked for utopian traits. So just stuff like no one goes hungry, which doesn't describe the whole world. It just says like, well, you know, in an ideal world, no one would go hungry. And actually a lot of those scored really well. So it's like, you know, there's no description of a world that I got a lot of a lot of excitement or agreement on. But then stuff like there's no disease, there's no hunger, everyone lives to age X healthily and even for like pretty high numbers, even for like age, you know, 100 or 1,000 was getting like pretty good agreement on them. Mm. And so, you know, that that was something too is that like, you can get people to agree on like some basic stuff, um, but it's just it's hard to describe the whole thing without without kind of offending someone. D- didn't you ask, uh, you know, would it be good if uh, everyone or if people were sleeping with many other partners and people didn't like that, and then they also yeah. didn't like it if they were only sleeping with one partner, which I guess only leaves one remaining option of sleeping with nobody, which, I, which you didn't ask about. But yeah, <laughs> it's perhaps a bit of a, a bit of contradiction. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's straight up contradiction. I think it's more just showing that you can't get consensus. Mm. So I think some people like one, some people like the other. But I actually did add a third option. So I had I had one. There was something like people, yeah, people have many lovers. Another that was like people are monogamous and faithful to one lover. And then I had a third option that's people have the choice of which one to be. Mm. And then I used randomization to see which one people saw. And none of them scored that well. So it's like, you know, none, <laughs> none of those of three scored that, including okay. the choice. And so I think that was just illustrating to me that it's just... Well, there really is only compulsory celibacy as the remaining option. Right? Yeah, I didn't think to test that one. I don't think it would have pulled very well. Um, Probably not. Either. So, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's more just like the act of describing it just, just seems too specific. And it, it always seems to offend someone. And I think it's mm. kind of an interesting obstacle to, to having conversations about the future. Yeah. I mean, it seems like in, in literature, utopias are almost necessarily going to have like a negative edge to them because you can't write, write a book about a world where just everyone is rich and happy and there's no conflict. That would be incredibly boring. Uh, do you think that's part of the thing that like people are primed to think that utopias must be disturbing because that's how they're always presented in, in fiction? Uh, that's more of a modern thing. I mean, I think there are definitely literary utopias. I mean, there are definitely books that just, you know, looking backward by Edward Bellamy is just trying to it's really, it's like the plot is this guy, I forget, I think there's some time travel involved, and he's, mm. he's you know, walking around this world, and everyone's just explaining how wonderful it is. Okay. Um, and they don't, know like, kill everyone at 40 or something like that. There's yeah, no, like, no there's, nothing, there's nothing to it. And, and it, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't sound today like the kind of novel that would sell very well. It was very successful at the time. People oh. were, like, starting societies that were based on the ideals of this novel. So mm. it's not like there's no precedent for utopian literature that is successful and that people like. I mean, it does sound kind of boring to me, but... Um, yeah, it's not it's not really inherent to the situation, so I don't really know what it is. Yeah, do you think it's useful for more people to, to do these kinds of surveys? Should, should we trust the, the general public to determine what kind of utopia we, we march forward into? Uh, well, I, yeah, I mean, I'm cer- I certainly wasn't trying to take a vote. I was, <laughs> I was more just trying to understand yeah. how people think let's, about let, things. Let's and, not yeah. include ISIS in the vote when we yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I will say uh, I would rather people apply to be research analysts, but, you know, it could be, could be kind of interesting, yeah. My guest today has been Holden Karnowski. Thanks for coming on the show, Holden. Cool. Thanks a lot, Rob. I hope you enjoyed that episode. There were a number of articles that we talked about, which I've linked to in the associated blog post. If you're considering applying to the Open Philanthropy Project, you may want to read our problem profile on global priorities research, which I'll add a link to as well. For those thinking about the AI-focused roles, I'll link to our profile on positively shaping the development of artificial intelligence. And finally, for those interested in the operations roles, we discuss those in our career review of working in effective altruism-focused organizations, which obviously I'll link to as well. If you know someone who would be suitable for one of the positions that we've talked about, it would be great if you could forward them the show so they can have a listen. And if you enjoyed this episode, you should also check out episode 10 with Open Field Program Officer Nick Beckstead, 
episode eight with OpenFill Program Officer Lewis Bollard, and episode four with a past employee of OpenFill, Howie Lample. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.